So welcome, welcome to our uh, workshop. Um, it's uh, put together by Clemus and the uh, New Mexico State Climate Office. And Clemus, if you're not familiar with the Climate Assessment of the Southwest, it's a um, NOAA-funded um, consortium uh, between um, mainly Ari University of Arizona and New Mexico. It's, it's for both states, right? So, um, and we do a lot of different things. And, and this is kind of the, one of the um, outreach is you know bringing the research out and let people know not just put it into a paper but let's discuss it and how can we change and improve things. Um, let me quit. I know. So. <laughs> Uh, we have some people attending remotely. It's an experiment. Yeah, this is an experiment. <laughs> uh, my name is Dave Dubois. If you don't know me, I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself. I'm the state climatologist for New Mexico, and I'm also um, part w part of the Clemus Research Group. And um, so uh, I think what we're going to do is get started uh, by doing a uh, a round of um, introductions, so everybody knows. I don't know most of most everybody here. <laughs> I think I know. By your sign in, but not your face. So um, I, I, again, I'll start here, and then we'll just go around this way, maybe. I'm Dave Dubois. Jerry Wade. Bill King. Yeah. Oh, it's Chris's. Okay. I'm Phil King, a professor in civil engineering here at NMSU and consultant to EBID. Hello, I'm Delbert Humberson, the GIS program manager at the International Boundary Water Commission. Good morning, Michael Riley with Office of the State Engineer here in Las Cruces. No, <laughs> hiding in the back. Uh, Les Owen with New Mexico Department of Agriculture. I'm John Longworth. I'm Chief of the Water Use and Conservation Bureau for the Office of the State Engineer. I'm Naveel Shafiq, hydrologist with New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission. Good morning. I'm Ralph Schmidt Peterson. I'm the Rio Grande Basin Manager for the New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission. I'm Max Kleiweiss. I work at New Mexico State University doing satellite remote sensing. Nanny Cora, Civil Engineer, Environmental Protection Assistant for International Boundary Water Commission. Albert Flores, Environmental Protection Specialist, International Boundary Water Commission. Okay, thank you. Um, and let me Pass the mic back to Connie. Um, Connie will be our speaker. Um, she's going to lead the, give her a talk and uh, lead this discussion. And, and uh, let me just transfer this over. Okay. Right, I'm Connie Willis. I'm from the University of Arizona. I'm with the Department of Geography and Development. I'm also with the Laboratory of Tree Ring Research. So that's um, why so I sort of get my tree ring credentials. Um, let's see. So we did the introductions. New Mexico State is hosting us, and I'm really glad that Dave has been able to help us out. Um, climate Assessment for the Southwest, there's a, a little leaflet in your folder if you want more information on that. That actually is a program where we're hoping as scientists to connect with people who could use scientific information. So if you are thinking, you know, I really would, you know, it'd be great to hook up with some people about the weather, the climate, something like that, let me know or let Dave know because we're sort of a program that networks. Um, some of you may, might know Zach Guido. I don't know. He was over here, I think, last year um, doing some, talking to some people and doing some articles and, and doing some videos uh, for the Rio Grande area. So this is what we're going to do in, uh, in three hours. It'll be sort of a, some of you have been to work, these workshops, you know, they're, they're a little bit intensive, um, but they're informal. So, I mean, we have a small group. Um, I don't want to just stand up here and lecture. I do that to students, and it's frankly not that much fun. <laughs> What's fun is getting uh, some interaction, getting some questions, um, hearing what you're thinking about, what, what you're not understanding, what you're getting, and, and, and want to, you know, expound upon. So I'll start with a little bit of a background on these workshops. This is actually the fourth workshop we've had in New Mexico. I'll talk um, pretty briefly about the basics of tree ring research, and a couple of you have already heard this, so it'll be a little bit of a review, but basically how we go from tree rings to reconstructions of past flow and some of the applications very briefly. Then I'll talk about, in particular, reconstructions of the Rio Grande at Otoe. I'm going to focus on Otoe. I'll talk about the Rio Grande at Del Norte a little bit. 
and about lower Rio Grande monsoon precipitation, which is, uh, that's new work. Um, I'll talk uh, to some extent about the, comparing these two records, and what I'm doing is just what makes sense to me in terms of the questions that I have, how are these, how are these related, and you may have completely different questions, so what I'm showing you is only an example of the kind of thing we can you do with this information, and really, I want to hear from you. It's like, well, that's you know, that's not the question we're asking. We're asking this question, and maybe we can look at the the data in in a way that makes it more informative to you. I'll talk. So, sorry to interrupt, but we're having technical difficulties. Oh, okay. It's not changing the slide. Oh, on the on the yeah. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit um, also about the Rio Conchos. There was some interest in that, and I don't know if the people who are interested in that are here in the room or if they are listening in, but a little bit of, of, about the Rio Conchos. And then at the end, uh, have time for discussions, questions, comments, and of course, throughout. So I don't know, of the folks uh, out there in Google land, <laughs> we're having a, a technical um, difficulty with the slide changing, so hang in there for a minute. There's a bit of a delay in terms of what's happening here and what's happening for the people that are watching remotely. Anybody have any questions so far? There's more coffee outside. If that one pot goes empty, there's a, another pot. We'll have a break in the middle. I think the restrooms are on that side. There's, there, instead of a water fountain, there's this machine. <laughs> So where's the water fountain? It's a machine with a cup, so you press the button and <laughs> I was like <laughs> Okay, um, it looks like if it's full screen it's not gonna show up on Google, so it has to kind of stay like that. Okay, well we're a small enough group. If you have trouble seeing, you can sit near the front. Okay? <laughs> all right. Hopefully someone's out there watching. <laughs> can you all hear me okay? My voice does not project very well, but um, and also I, I tend to speak a little fast, so I'll try to uh, moderate that. Okay, so the workshops. We did, a, we did a, a series of two workshops that were part of a project funded by NOAA, separately, a little separately from Clemus. Uh, one back in November of 2007 and a follow-up to that workshop in May of 2008, and those were focusing on Streamflow. Um, I think uh, Rolf and Nabil were at, at the first the second workshop, I can't remember, and I know that we presented the reconstruction of the Rio Grande at Del Norte, and you guys said, hey, it's the Odoe gauge that we care about. So we went back, <laughs> and we reconstructed the Odoe flows, and that was the, in the second workshop. And in that workshop, some people said, you know, what about the monsoon? Can you get us the monsoon from tree rings? And we said, well, you can notice from 2008 to the next workshop was four years, and that's because we had to submit a proposal for funding from the National Science Foundation, which we got. And uh, that supported work to reconstruct monsoon uh, precipitation reconstructions. And so that's what we presented uh, last, a year ago last May in Albuquerque, um, talking about uh, the Rio Grande flow and the monsoon precipitation for an area a little bit north of here. And then this workshop is focusing a little bit further south, um, again, talking about Rio Grande flow, um, lower Rio Grande monsoon, so for an area a little bit further south, and then the Rio Conchos um, a bit, which is work I've done a little while ago, but I wasn't I wasn't clear who was interested in that. Mm -hmm. Grande, right, I know. I'll show you a map in just a second. I know. I realize that there's a lot of middle Rio Grande, lower Rio Grande. So the purpose is to provide you with this information and to learn from you how, you know, if this information is valuable in a different format or Analyze in a different way. I'd love to hear about that. So here's the map. Um, so the stream flow is focusing on the headwaters here. Um, the Odoe gauge, I think, is is it north of Santa Fe? But there's north of Santa Fe. Yeah, and uh, and the Nor Del Norte gauge is up here. So focusing on the headwaters. The headwaters are, as you all know, are snow melt driven. So it's mostly cool season precipitation that's influencing the stream flow in this area. Um, this is what I'm calling the lower Rio Grande. And this is an arbitrary definition. Um, the I have another reconstruction of the of Rio Grande for the monsoon that's division, climate division five, which is from a little bit north of Albuquerque down. Uh, it overlaps with this area a little bit. And I'll talk a little bit about that one as well. And then the Rio Conchos down here. 
Um, this was a this is a reconstruction of October through July precipitation. I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, it's hard to get gauge data down there, and so we used um, precipitation. Data. Yeah. One more technical issue. When somebody asks a question, can you repeat it? Because right. Our, I'm, our audio listener. Is I great. know. Yeah. I'm bad at that. <laughs> Just like you can <laughs> poke me if I forget. <laughs> so that's our our geographic area. So the first part. Uh, again, it's going to be this overview of how we use tree rings to reconstruct climate, how trees record climate, how reconstructions uh, of past climate and hydrology are developed, uncertainty in the reconstructions, and the kinds of information that we can get from the reconstructions. So how do tree rings record climate information? This is a cartoon of a conifer, and I should, you've probably all figured this out. You've got four slides per page on your handouts. You can scribble along on those. Um, and for those that, that you're listening, I'll try, to tell, I'll try to mention once in a while what slide number we're on, which is number nine right now. So we have uh, annual rings that are shown in this cartoon. Here's the bark. Here's the pith, the middle of the tree. This is a young tree. We've got annual ringlets. Um, they're separated by light, the light colored wood, which is called early wood, and the late wood, which is um, the darker colored wood that forms at the end of the growing season. Together they form the annual ring. You can see these rings are of different widths. And in, uh, in throughout the southwest United States, if we sample the right kind of tree, the annual ring widths are responding to the environmental conditions that influence tree growth. And in, in this area, it's primarily climate. Yes, Rolf. Is there, a, is there a good definition just in timing during the year about what early wood time period would be and late wood? Uh, the question was, is there a definition of how we can define when early wood and late wood occur? And the, and the answer to that is not really. That's, you know, we've done, or my colleagues have done some work where they've actually put a band around a tree and looked at the measurements, uh, like, weekly to try to figure out when the tree is, is putting on wood and, and doing a punch core also to see what the, the cells look like. And it's not, it's, it, it's, there have been really experimental studies that haven't been very long lived. And so what we think is, and this is important for the monsoon, and I'll get back to it, is that um, once that late wood starts growing, that's, that's pretty representative of the monsoon season. But it's rough right now. We don't know exactly. And I just was wondering in regards to the you know, precipitation events we had last week, and 600% of the three-year average precipitation over a seven-day period, Mm -hmm. Does that show up in the tree or not? It probably, uh, that's a good question. Um, my hunch is it may well not, especially if a lot of that is running off and not soaking into the soil. And that's the problem I'll, I'll show you in some of the, what we, the uncertainty in the reconstructions. The, we do less of a good job with the really wet conditions because the tr cause some of it, in those conditions, some of it will run off so the tree won't get it. In some cases, the tree gets, will get a, grow a bigger ring uh, when it's wet, but at some point, more water won't get produce an even bigger ring. The tree, the tree is limited by something else, and so we don't get the really, really high uh, um, wet values. So the, um, the the vascular cambium is where the new cells are grown every year, and so if we want to sample a tree and date it, we can start by looking at that ring right inside the bark, and that's the current year of growth. So that's how the the dating is anchored. Well, could you explain that false ring? The false ring, yeah. Um, this is a, it's an intra-annual ring. It's, a, it's not a true ring. What happens here in the southwest is that, um, and this is, we've done a lot of work on this project and we still have questions about this, but the false ring uh, occurs uh, when the tree starts growing in the beginning of the growing season and then the, the fore season before the monsoon when it gets very hot and dry. If conditions are severe enough, um, and we have the right sequence, and we're still working on that, what the sequence is uh, of prior winter conditions. The, the trees may think that, oh, it's the end of the growing season. Its, it's conditions are bad for growth. So we're going to shut down and put on that late wood, the dark wood. And then when the monsoon comes, the trees, oh, it's time to grow again. And they'll, they'll grow through the monsoon season, and then at the end of the true growing season, they'll put on that late wood. So in some cases, um, in some sites, we find um, a high incidence of false rings, where those trees are putting on false rings almost every year. And we've actually tried to work with the false rings as an indicator, and it's really hard. <laughs> We're still working on that. Yes? I'm sorry, but in that false ring, how, how do you discriminate between you know, that being something that happened 
during the year, like for monsoon versus just a really bad year, man. Stop and then we have to Right. Yeah. So the question is, how can we tell it's a false ring and not a real ring? And that's a really good question. If you, you can't really see it on here, but if you look under the microscope, you can see that the uh, the cells at the end of the growing season, there's a real definite boundary. Those cells stop. Those dark cells stop. And then uh, the early wood for the next year starts. And in that false ring, we can usually see that gradation is a little more gradual. So they're pretty pretty easy to define. But uh, some species in the southwest, like juniper, have so many false rings, multiple false rings in a year, and sometimes they won't grow a ring in a year, that we cannot use them. <laughs> um, and that's, this isn't shown here, but in some cases we, we have trees that don't grow a ring in a year. Um, up in Colorado, at some of the sites in the, in the Colorado headwaters, we had most of the rings, uh, most of the trees in an area not growing a ring in 2002 where we sampled the tree. Um, we sam that's why we sample a lot of trees in an area because you can usually find a, a tree that's growing on a slightly more favorable site that will grow a little tiny ring, maybe a couple of cells wide. So we can identify that. Also, if you sample up the tree, the tree will have maybe have that ring further up because the wood is formed from the top down. So when we date these ring patterns, we have what we're actually doing besides just counting is we're matching ring patterns from tree to tree so we make sure we're accounting for those missing rings that are not there in some years and that we're, we're able to puzzle out if we have questions about these false rings, they're not going to be in all the trees. So we're actually matching, uh, keying in on the, the narrow rings which have a very, very faithful pattern uh, in, the, in the trees in an area. So that enables us to assign exact calendar year dates for these rings. And that, sorry to be so interested in that, but that false ring has been known for a long time, or has that led ambiguity to older tree ring dating? No, these are these have been identified early on, um, and they've been we you know, except for species like juniper, and there might be some other ones like mesquite. I'm not sure. Um, in ponderosa pine and Douglas fir, um, which are the tr species that are most prone to putting on false rings, pinion doesn't. Um, they've been identified. And they're 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 not consistent enough from tree to tree that, you know, we can match them with the with the sequences and, and figure out oh we're off oh uh, that's you know that's a false ring there especially with students who are not used to what they're looking at yes how does temperature play into this temperature how does temperature play into this that's a good question um, we'll 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 get to that but the short answer at the moment is that these trees are limited by moisture and so it's um, it's it's going to be a combination of um, temperature to, to some extent in terms of moisture stress, uh, but it's mostly for these lower species, it's mostly driven by um, um, precipitation itself. But like the beginning of growing season, is that temperature driven or is that moisture driven? We're not sure. In these lower elevation species, we're not sure. At the upper elevation species and in high latitudes, those trees are definitely keying into the length of the growing season, which is the, the degree days temperatures, but at lower elevations we're not exactly sure what promotes their onset, if it's the, the, light, the light, length of light. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure on that. All right, moving on, slide 10. So what trees are the best recorders of precipitation and moisture? Um, when we're out in the field and we're looking for trees to sample, um, we usually go to sites that are um, don't have a lot of soil that are that are southwest facing slopes that are getting really stressed by the environmental conditions and this is typically the case um, in Colorado New Mexico and the, the sort of higher elevations the mountainous areas Sam like for the monsoon has been a little bit of a different experience where we're, we're sort of some of the sites that we always went to are actually too stress too stressful for trees to give us good information down on the sky islands of Arizona and some of the areas around here. But rule of thumb is we're looking for trees that are stressed by moisture, they don't have a lot of soil, not trees that are growing with their roots in the ground groundwater, like we're going to be talking about reconstructions of stream flow and we're not collecting trees that have their, their roots down by the water, and I'll get to that. Um, species we use are Douglas fir, pinion pine, and ponderosa pine around here and throughout uh, the southwest. I'm sorry, I didn't hear but you first said you said essentially you look at the southwest facing slopes. Yeah, slopes that are more that are getting more sun, that, that stressing the trees a bit more. 
This is an example of a uh, ringlet series, so just the measurements of the rings um, for one pinion tree. This is in uh, Western Colorado, uh, with Western Colorado annual precipitation, just graphed together. So precipitation in blue, ring width in green, and you can see the correspondence is, is, is pretty darn good. This is the kind of relationship we're looking for. We have wide rings in wet years and narrow rings in dry years. And we, we don't just use one tree, but that's just an example to show you how good the correspondence can be. So getting back to um, stream flow, uh, and the idea that we're not sampling trees that are growing right by the river. Um, how does that work? It turns out that um, the species that we're talking about in this area tend to be most interested in the moisture at the beginning of the growing season. When you're looking at the entire ring, um, that entire, if you correlate that ring width um, with climate, monthly climate data, the strongest correlations are with the cool season precipitation which seems counterintuitive. You think, well, the trees aren't growing in the winter. But it's snowing in the winter, it's raining in the winter, and all that moisture is going to be available in the soil when the tree starts to grow in the spring. And so that's the strongest relationship that we see. So that um, snowpack is really um, associated with annual ringlets because of this connection. So the ring widths and stream flow, if we're talking about water year stream flow in particular, so October through September, so we're getting that winter deposition uh, period, um, are both integrated by <clears throat> the effects of precipitation, particularly the winter precipitation and evapotranspiration as mediated by the soil. So when we look for trees that are going to reflect uh, variations in Rio Grande stream flow, we look at trees that are located in areas where the winter storms are um, in common with the basin. So it may not be the basin boundaries because the storms go outside of the basin. So it's not a direct, for the stream flow, it's not a direct relationship. It's an indirect relationship, but it's linked by this, this winter precipitation that both of them, uh, it, it's important to, very important to both of them, to the water year stream flow amounts and to the annual ring width. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about sort of the climate um, tree growth relationships. We'll talk more about the monsoon and the interannual rings when I talk about the monsoon reconstruction. So how do we do these reconstructions? I'm going to walk you through from the field work to the actual statistical model of the reconstruction. So when we go out in the field, we're looking for old trees because those will give us the longest records. We're looking for trees that are growing in sites that we think are being stressed by climate so they give us climate information and trees that are not being affected by roads or by picnic grounds where people are hammering on the trees or trees that look like they've been struck by lightning or damaged in other ways. So we're trying to get trees that have the cleanest information about climate. Um, and, we're, and the species that we know about that are most uh, useful are, the again, the ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, and pinion pine. Once we find a site that that has meets those conditions, we'll sample um, typically about 20 trees at a site. Um, we're finding for the monsoon work we need to sample more trees. And we need to sample maybe 30 or 40 trees to get uh, a good signal. We use an increment bore, which is a, a hollow shaft of steel. They come in different lengths. The one I usually use is about 20 inches long. It's, it's a hollow shaft of steel. It's got a bit at the, at the end. We crank it into a tree. We pull out the core, which is about a, about a pencil diameter width. Um, we also, we haven't uh, done this so much in the Rio Grande area, but in the Colorado River Basin, we've made a lot of use of dead wood on the landscape. We could do that work here, we just haven't done it yet. Um, in areas where it's fairly dry, um, in the southwest, pieces of wood can stay on the landscape for hundreds and hundreds of years. So we can use that wood to extend our living tree chronologies back in time. We have the Colorado River reconstruction goes back to 762, and that's not because the trees are that old, uh, trees in the area, our oldest trees go back to the 1100s, but we're getting pieces of wood on the landscape that are just kind of, you know, they're dried out and they're eroded by wind, but they don't decompose. So we can sample those pieces of wood and we can look at the ring width patterns. And if we match the ring width pattern with the living trees, if it overlaps in time, then we can then determine when those, the dead wood, uh, um, dates, and we can use that to, to augment our living tree chronology going back in time. So that's something we should probably do for the Rio Grande Basin, and we haven't we haven't done it yet. It's it's possible to do. 
Sorry, I didn't understand that. You said your oldest tree was 17, something or other, and then you said something about 11 degrees? Yeah, well, well, in the Colorado River Basin, our oldest living trees go back to the 1100s, but the actual reconstruction based on trees goes back to 700. So how, you know, how do we get back that far? We've sampled a lot of the deadwood on the landscape, which those trees die, the wood falls down, it, it actually sits there for... Right, I mean, we, it's, so okay. you've found living trees that are 1100? Yeah, we have, in the Colorado River Basin. I'm trying to think what the oldest in the Rio Grande is. They're not... We've got some back in the 1400s. Yeah. So I, I'm just curious where 1100-year-old uh, Do you know Colorado very well? Uh, the, the oldest um, Douglas fir is near Grand Junction up on Grand Mesa. And then we have uh, the oldest pinion is up um, towards um, it's, it's the northwestern part of the state. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, if you're uh, wandering around looking for old trees, that old trees are not the biggest trees. We used to try to work with the Forest Service and ask them where, you, where your old trees were, and they would always send us to the biggest trees. And the biggest trees are usually the ones that are right near the stream, and they're getting lots of water, and so they have huge rings, and the rings are all about the same size. <laughs> so, yeah, the oldest trees, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a bristlecone pine tree. The really old ones are really gnarly and twisted, and they're not all that big. And the oldest, same thing with the oldest of these species. They tend to be kind of runty looking, kind of hanging in there, you know, maybe not much living greenery on them, but... Uh, um, so, in other words, not good for logging. Not good for logging, and also, related to that, they tend to be in places where it's hard to get to them. They may be on talus slopes or up, up in areas where they've not been burned, or where there's not a lot of other forest vegetation to carry insects. So they're hanging in there, they're not being affected by other things that might disturb them. All right. So once we have collected all of our wood, we take it back to the lab. This is actually one of our collections from the Colorado. We have lots of these old pieces of wood. Um, we have, uh, these are, this is what a core looks like once we sand them down and mount them into wooden core mounts. We um, we sand them down to really, really high polish using progressively finer grits of sandpaper. So we're actually able to see the, the ring, individual cells within the rings. Because as you can imagine, some of these cells are really, really small. Maybe only a couple of, or the rings are small, only a couple cells in width. And so we want to make sure we see those rings, especially in years like 2002 where they're, they, they, they're, you know, they can be that small. So we mount them, um, we, we date them. Uh, this is, it's a little hard to see here, but the, the, the three holes is 1900, the, the single hole is 1910, 1920, 1930. You can pick out some of the sequences. Um, 1911 is a really small year. Um, 1930s, you're starting to see the sequence of the 1930s. 1950s, I mean, uh, <clears throat> this is Jeff Lucas, who has did an awful lot of work with me, and he did most of the dating for the... the uh, the Rio Grande work, and he had sequences of ringlets in his head, and I had them too, but not as not, I had them back. You know, the 20th century. You could say, oh, it's you know, it's um, you know, 2002, 1981, 1956, 1954, 1934, 1925, 1902. You know, and then he would like go back into the 1400s. <laughs> but these sequences are very, very robust, and so we're matching those sequences so that we're able to date these with um, with with precision. So once they're dated, we measure them using a system that looks like this. This is a, um, a sliding stage. This is a little platform on it. That's a little chunk of wood, and that's the microscope. And so the viewer will look at the wood uh, through the microscope, and there's a crosshair on the, in the eyepiece of the microscope. So you line the ring boundary up with that, that uh, crosshair, and then there's a crank here. Turn it, move the, the stage one ring width, hit a trigger, and measure the, the ring width. And so it's very manual. <laughs> Occupy lots of undergraduate students uh, uh, working this way. So all the all the cores are measured. Um, the cross sections the same way are measured, and all of these measurements are put together to create what we call a site uh, tree and chronology. But before we put them together, there's a couple of things that we need to pay attention to. We're sampling the oldest trees we can find in the site, but the trees are of different ages. And so if you think about looking at a cross section, if you're you know if it's just a a tree that's been growing, um, you know, it's not been terribly stressed. Usually the rings in the middle are bigger than the rings on the outside, and that's just 
due to the fact that the tree has, you know, when the tree has a smaller geometry, it, it can put on a bigger ring using the same amount of resources as it puts on when it's a bigger tree. And so there's a geometric effect. Um, for tree age, and you can see it, these are ring widths over time, so you can see the big rings in the younger part of the tree and then they get smaller as they go out. And if you have different uh, trees of different ages in one collection and you're going to average them together, if you average them together without paying attention to the fact that this is due to the geometry of the tree, not the climate, you get an average of ringlets that looks like this and you get these bumps that are due to the geometry or the age of the tree and not the climate. So we detrend all of these series first to remove that growth trend and uh, once we do that we have a series that doesn't have the effects of tree age mixed up into it. I had yes. a question from one of the oh. off site and the question was what are the measures taken after the core is taken to prevent any damage to the tree? Oh, okay, that's a good question. So, okay. <laughs> So the question is, what happens when, what happens, do, does it hurt the tree to take a core out of it? Which is a question we get often, and this has been uh, actually a question of, 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 of quite some discussion in the tree and community. Um, I sort of make, it's sort of, for me it's an analogy, you get a shot in your arm and you bleed a little bit, and that's kind of what happens with a tree. Um, if, you, if you're coring particularly a coniferous tree, an evergreen tree, there's a lot of sap, the tree will, will quickly try to heal that wound and so the sap will come in and fill that hole. We've seen that taking cores, coming back, walking back a few minutes later and seeing the sap coming out of the tree. Um, there's been discussion about well, whether we should plug that hole with some wax or something or plug it. And there's, uh, there's the tree ring, uh, a branch of tree ring studies that has to do with disease and fungus and the consensus on that side said no, don't put foreign objects into the tree. The tree can heal perfectly well on its own. So um, that's, that's the answer on that one. I feel, I feel a little bad. Sometimes some of the really old bristlecone pines that uh, don't even have any bark anymore have been sampled by generations of dendrochronologists and you can still, if you go up to some of these bristlecone pine sites in Colorado and California, you can still see the holes in the tree from the generations. <laughs> but yeah, those trees seem to be impervious. So that's a good question. All right, so this is just showing you that we're taking, these are, this is from a site in Colorado, but we do the same thing everywhere else. Um, we have, we sampled 15 trees, two cores per tree, which is, I forgot to add, we usually sample two cores per tree. These are all the, the, this, the uh, detrended measurements, and we're going to average all those together to create the site chronology. And the reason that, again, that we're averaging so many together is that we're, each tree will have, its own sort of thing going on in its site, its sort of microsite conditions. And we're not interested in those microsite conditions. We're, we're interested in sort of the, the regional what's going on, which is the climate signal. So if we get a number of these and we average them together, we'll screen out the, the, the tree-specific information and, and preserve the common information, which is the climate information. So that's why we sample so many trees. And that's why when we sample for the monsoon, we need to get even more because we're just sampling up smaller portion of that ring. Right, uh, so, so you're asking about the change in the, in the sample, the numbers of trees that go into the chronology over time. That's a good question too. Because at a certain point, if we're basing our reconstruction on these long chronologies that at the very end maybe only have a few trees, there's a question about whether that's how reliable that is. We actually do a statistic where we're, we're estimating a common signal in a group of samples here and we come up with, well, to get a, a robust uh, common signal, we use a rule of thumb of 0.85. We need, you can tell, we need, in this case, you know, I'm just guessing here, probably six or eight trees. And that's why when we sample for the monsoon, that number goes up. We need to have more trees for a reliable reconstruction. And we'll actually cut the reconstruction off. If we're, you know, we can actually develop the reconstruction, but we're just not as confident about that end where we don't have very many trees. We don't have enough to meet our subsample uh, threshold. Okay. So this is just a map that shows the tree and chronologies that have been contributed to the International Tree and Data Bank, um, which is hosted by NOAA in Boulder. And it's from all different um, uh, researchers that have contributed their data. These are just 
this, the species codes, which don't mean a whole lot, I know. Different species for trees that are sensitive to moisture and that are greater than 200 years in length. So there's been a lot of, a lot of collections. There's a lot of data available. One of the problems we're having uh, with many of these collections is that this is collections from, from when researchers started making these collections, which was, you know, even in the 1930s. So in some cases, these chronologies haven't been updated for a couple of decades. Um, and that's when, our, with our monsoon project, we went back and updated a lot of these chronologies in that process. But nobody wants to fund updating triggering chronology is not, it's just not very interesting. However, I have to say that Denver Water um, up in Colorado did fund us to update a set of, chron excuse me, a set of chronologies for like three years because they wanted to see if the trees actually got 2002, which is so devastatingly dry. They're like, okay, let's see if the trees replicated the severity of that year and the trees did. So they're like, okay, we're on board. <laughs> There's actually a uh, species team this is a no. <laughs> what we what we <laughs> what we do is we take the first two letters, which is the first. This is like um, ponderosa p i, pinus ponderosa. <laughs> so no, they don't have their own species. They probably would like to have their own species. <laughs> Any questions on on that? I'm going through this pretty fast. Um, so we had some people that walked in in the back. Do you guys want to uh, introduce yourselves? I know I kind of like glossed over, but do you want to just say who you are and who you're with? Yeah, I'm Ikiyo. Can we introduce ourselves? Okay. 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 Yeah, Okay. All right. Great. Well, thanks. I'm glad you could make it. There's uh, coffee and bagels if you if you're hungry from your trip up from El Paso. Well, and we'll have a break, so we'll get the chance to talk. All right. Well, this is the general schematic of the process that we go through when we reconstruct climate or hydrology. And I'll show you this model, and then I'll show you the pieces individually. So we start. We have tree rings. They're going to be used as predictors for our reconstruction, and we have observed data that we want to reconstruct. The observed data can be precipitation, it can be uh, stream flow, it can be um, snowpack, April 1st snow water equivalent, some kind of a observed climate record, which is what we're going to be predicting the predict in. And we statistically calibrate the tree rings with the observed data using usually some kind of a regression approach. That's the most common approach, although there's other methods that are being uh, explored. We develop a reconstruction model, which is a, is, ends up being an equation. We do model validation in a couple different ways, which I'll go over. And then once we're happy with that model, how it validates, we'll um, plug in our true and chronologies for their full length into that equation to get the reconstruction. So let's take that apart. Requirements for the observed climate or hydrology records. We're doing a calibration, and uh, the most robust calibration is going to be on a fairly long overlap period between the tree and chronologies and the climate or hydrology data. Generally, you know, 40 years is kind of a threshold. I mean, if we really have nothing else to work with, we've gone to 30 years. But this, the shorter the period of overlap, the less robust our, our uh, model calibration is going to be. Quality of the instrumental data. We used to naively think that the tree ring, if, if our model was not that great, it was because the tree rings were failing to get the climate or hydrology, but we've started to see more and more that there's problems with the climate data and the hydrology data. Um, and I, I'm sure Dave knows this as a state climatologist, the climate stations move, the instruments change, um, so that the, even if you have a long record, it may not be that reliable because there's been changes in the, in the, that are not due to just the climate in the record. Um, hydrology is even more challenging at times. We have some good uh, natural flows high in the watershed, and that's why we like to use the Colorado uh, Del Norte gauge for Rio Grande because there's only one reservoir above that, and, the, and even the state of Colorado has done some adjustments for those values. The Odoe gauge was a lot more challenging to do because we had some estimates from the NRCS, and we also did some of our own. I've been working in the Klamath recently, and man, what a mess over there. They, 
the Bureau did estimated natural flows from a very complicated model. There's a lot of surface marshy land and a uh, lot of complicated groundwater over there in the Klamath, and nobody likes the estimated natural flows. <laughs> so we're like, well, what do we use? So that's a challenge. Um, in terms of the climate data, we're now using uh, gr gridded climate data more than station data, which is sort of does the hard work of integrating the climate data that's available um, in, the, in the best way, screening for station moves, screening for elevation. Um, and so the climate data that I'm using have been based on uh, climate data from the PRISM group. Yes? This might be a little off, uh, Connie, on that with regards to the work you're doing here, but thinking about the gridded climate data, is that the same gridded climate data that people are using uh, to do downscaling with these slower circulation models? You know, they're making sure it's consistency in that? Uh, that gridded data, that gridded, he's asking if the gridded data um, that I'm talking about is the same, is related to the downscaling gridded data. It's not, um, that's model, model data that's being generated by the process of the modeling process. Now those folks are oftentimes validating their model based on the gridded climate data and they're usually looking at patterns of climate, you know, um, and, and, and and that and those patterns of observed climate data oftentimes now are coming from these gridded climate data products. The main one right now that we use is a is called Prism, and I can't remember what. Do you remember what? I don't remember what Prism stands for, but it's a product that comes out of Oregon State. And then NOAA is also has a gridded data set that they have not shared yet, or maybe they have, but they shared it with us. They haven't published it, I'll say. So that's that's kind of where we're going with the climate data these days. Instead of trying to, you know. I spent a lot of time looking at station data and talking to state climatologists about, well, do you, do you like, is this good record? And they go, no, 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 don't use that. <laughs> yes? Prism, remember, it measures temperature and precip. Those are your, prim your primary parameters of the precip data when you do your statistical reconstruction. Well, it depends on when I want to do a reconstruction, I'll use the precipitation data if I want to do a precipitation reconstruction. Um, but there's other variables that can be reconstructed too. Um, but you're right, Prism, I think, just does temperature and maximum mean temperature and and total precipitation, I think. I'm not sure. Prism goes back to 1896. Which using National Weather Service Network. Well, they're using everything they can get. So they're using uh, the co-op stations, they're using the, the, the good stations, they're using the snow course and snow tail data. I think as well. Um, I think they're using everything that they can get their hands on. They will be using Cocoraz. Yeah. And Cocoraz, which is the Colorado State University. Is it still Colorado? Is it? It's a nationwide. It's nationwide. Started it started the there. Policies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're integrating all that. Um, but that's sort of a cautionary. If you think about, um, you know, that data is available because they can generate it. But your question about the treeings and the sample depth going back in time is the same for the climate data. What are they actually basing the 1890s on? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> gritty climate data is really great, but a lot of work I use, we don't really favor it. Yeah, yeah, you use it with caution. Very generic. Yeah, because they and they do uh, elevation. They have algorithms for elevation that may not be exactly right. So nothing's perfect. <laughs> so just stuff to keep in mind. We're never going to have the perfect climate record for. You know, a number of purposes. But we. So let me ask you this question then: Would you first look for stations before going to grid, or are you just in your method just grid is there? It's easy. It's daily. It's just downloaded. It we usually have some considerations about that. Um, when we do our initial analysis, looking at the treeing data and the climate data, we usually look at different periods of time. And if we see the true climate relationship is really different in the early part of the record, or if it seems to change about 1930 when a lot of climate stations came online, we'll go, we might actually put that aside and say, we're going to use that to validate the model. We're not going to use it to calibrate the model. Things use like that. The station or use prism? The prism. To validate. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we'll use, use the entire record, but we'll just not use the early part because with because of the, the relationship doesn't look so good with the trees, we're thinking it's maybe not the trees so much as the climate data. So then um, will you also, depending where you are, try to find, so that, so that answers the question, you'll look for station data to kind of contrast. Yeah, and a, a lot of times I've been working in an area long enough to know what's available, and you go, well, 
I know, you know, in this area there's a couple of really nice long records. I think there's one at, it's, it's called Fort, what is it? There's a, there's a fort that was here for a while. Yeah, and then the university's a longer record too, so. Um, no, it's. The one that just closed is one of the good No, there's a, do you know the long record in? Silver City? Fort Bayard? Fort Bayard, yeah. Yeah, that's a really long record in. They just closed it. Uh, they did? Oh. oh, well. <laughs> they still have the climate station there? No. Oh, no. <laughs> Trying to get somebody to take it over, but you know. oh, that's too bad. Yeah. So we are. You were mindful of that. Okay. So that's what we need for the climate or hydrologic data. For the terrain data, we need. Uh, I've already talked about this moisture-sensitive species. Um, around here, this is pretty much what we have. If you go to the highest elevations, I'm not actually sure. I've seen both in the Oregon Mountains, and I think the species are Ponderosa pine and Douglas fir. I think that's all that you get there. But if you get up higher, further north, you'll run into species like Engelmann spruce or subalpine fir or lodgepole pine. And those trees are not as limited by moisture, and so we stay away from those. Sometimes Engelmann spruce will give us information about temperature. Um, but these lower elevation species, or relatively lower elevation species, are moisture sensitive. Location, um, we're collecting, uh, we're looking at chronologies that are in an area that's climatically linked to the region of interest. So again, um, we do analysis looking at uh, how, cl how climate, how coherent climate is for a region when we sort of look at our search area for the tree and chronologies. The length trade-off, um, we talked a little bit about this already. We have fewer chronologies that are available available further back in time and of course in those within those chronology we have fewer trees that go back in time so we have to make a decision at some point sometimes we can develop a reconstruction model that's more skillful but shorter because we have more data um, and we say well we can get this back to 1650 but we really 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 want to look look at that drought that we know that happened in the late 1500s so we're going to go with some you know some longer chronologies and so that you make that trade off between um, the length and um, possibly the skill. Going forward in time too, it's the same thing. Um, I mentioned we don't have, a lot of the chronologies haven't been updated, so we can say, well, we can only go up to 1993, and that's, that's getting to be more and more of a problem because we want to know what's happening now. What's, what about this drought? You know, how can we put this into context? If we only go up to 1993, which is what is the case for the Rio Conscious, then we, then we miss what's going on now. So um, that's sometimes what we're stuck with. Okay, so the modeling strategies, we have the chronologies as the predictor, we have the observed here precipitation as the predictin, we have the statistical calibration using some kind of regression. Linear or multiple linear regression are most common. Um, one sort of version of this is what we call principal components regression. If we have a lot of tree and chronologies that are growing, that are in an area and we're trying to decide how to reduce that number of chronologies, we can use a approach called principal components analysis, which groups those chronologies into main um, sort of trees that are behaving together in the same way. We may take those that group of trees as a predictor instead of a single tree. There's been other approaches that have been um, that have been tried, quantile regression, neural networks, um, some non-parametric methods. So regression is the most common and historically has been used most commonly, but it's by no means the only way to go. Um, we've probably tried more uh, methods for the Colorado River Basin. Everybody wants to reconstruct the Colorado River, so we, there's a lot of uh, different reconstructions, and they, I'll show you a, a, a graphic. Uh, they end up pretty much giving us the same story to some extent. So once we have that calibration, uh, we've calibrated a model, um, we want to check that model and make sure a couple of things um, are going on. We want to make sure we've got the aggression assumptions um, satisfied. And if you know regression statistics, you know that there's certain things like um, you can have a trend in the residuals. You don't want to have autocorrelation. These kind of statistical things that you just check for. Um, but more, maybe more to the point here is how does the model how does the model validate on data not used to calibrate the model? We always reserve some data that we don't use in the model to validate on. We either do uh, a leave one out method where we're leaving out certain cases and not calibrating on those and then, then looking at the estimates based on um, those values that were not in the calibrated model. That's one extreme. The other extreme is we're going to take half of the data 
only half of the of the instrumental data, and we're going to calibrate on that, and then we're going to validate on the other half, which means you lose half of the time period. Um, these days, I do a number of different. I look at it a number of different ways, just to satisfy myself that the, that the model is station is a uh, not stationary, but the model is um, stable over time, and take into consideration some of the factors about you know maybe the earlier part of the record is not as reliable uh, in terms of the, the the instrumental data. So this is just an example for the Colorado River at Lee's Ferry, which I shouldn't show because it's about as good of a match as we ever have done, which is we're explaining 81% of the variance in the gauge record. The gauge is in blue, the reconstruction is in green. And uh, yeah, 100% trees aren't perfect. 81% um, is pretty good. As you'll see for the Rio Grande, we're getting like 70, 74% of the explained variance, and less for the monsoon reconstructions. I just got a quick question. Mm -hmm. That's an annual flow. Right. So um, we talked about climate data. We didn't talk about runoff, like how you correlate precip into the river. Is that, how do you do that? Well, this is annual flows. This is, this is um, water year flow from the Bureau of Reclamation, their estimated natural flow series. Okay. So you're so saying. I'm talking about the tree rings. From the treeing stuff. How, so how does how do we go from treeings that rain? Not sure. I understand your question. We're integrating. Well, your tree's not at Lee's Ferry, right? Right, right. So, 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 so somehow or another, you have to go from Lee's Ferry up to wherever you're sampling the trees. Right. So the way that so we'll talk about the Rio Grande since that's where we are. Um, when we're reconstructing the Rio Grande at Otoe, we're, and I'll get to this, I'll show you where the chronologies are there throughout the basin. And those trees are um, not sensing flow, obviously, because they're not in the watershed. They're sensing the winter precipitation mostly because that's what leads to the soil moisture in the spring when the trees start to grow, and that's what the trees really, really care about. Mm -hmm. At the same time, that winter moisture, that snowpack, is what that gauge at Otoe is going to reflect. So what's sort of bringing what's what's causing that indirect connection to be pretty strong is the winter storm track and the winter snowfall. So it's the climatology of the winter. Does that make sense? So you're correlating just to that point. Yes. Uh, in terms of doing the doing this model, yes, we're just calibrating directly with the gauge data. Okay, that's Estimated natural flows. <laughs> that was your question. All right. Yes. We're not doing a hydrologic model. We're doing. We're just going using directly the gauge data. Yes, Nadia. Do you think the average of all the treating data from, say, the source of the water at Otto would be Rio Chama and the main stem? You're taking the average of all of these data correlated to the flow at all? More or less, yeah. I mean, we do it in a statistical way, so that's sort of weighting different ones. Um, actually, for the for this for the Otto one, actually, what Dave Miko ended up doing, the chronologies that work pretty well. So we're getting the representat representation of the upper basin. Okay, so once we're happy with that model, um, we then go back. It's it's an equation, a weighted equation, where we've got predictors that are chronologies or sets of chronologies. We plug our chronologies uh, into that uh, equation for their full length and develop the full reconstruction. Again, this is the Colorado River, just as an example. Did you say that? Yes. <laughs> once we develop our reconstruction model, it's a regression equation, and so it's got. Uh, uh, weighted, um, the treeings are weighted and <coughs> added together in the regression equation. That's the that's, that's the true. model. Then we take the longer the chronologies for the full length, and we replace them with the chronologies that are just for the instrumental period, and develop that equation for so we have a value for every year going back in time. Yes. Yes. Are you smoothing? Uh, in this particular case, the light line is the annual value, and the dark line, I think, is a 10-year running average. But we're actually, the, the reconstruction is, is an annual reconstruction. So we're getting values for every year. Do you have the, the time series that you actually did the calibration on, and the one that you did the validation on, and this draws this graph? I don't think I have that. Um, I don't think I have that with me, because I do it a couple different ways. And I, I, don't, think I, I don't think I show that, but I could. OK, so some of the sources of uncertainty in these reconstructions, which we've already talked about a little bit. Um, I should 
I keep forgetting to do this. We're on slide 26, if those of you who are following along are getting lost. Um, the trees, of course, are in, imperfect recorders of climate. They are responding to other factors besides climate. Um, even the most tree that's growing in an area that doesn't have, uh, you know, it isn't being affected by human activity. It may be affected by insects. It may be affected by uh, fungus, um, which are linked to climate but are, are not what we're looking for. So they're not perfect work recorders of climate or hydrology. Um, and the reconstruction model will never explain all of the variance in the observed record. It's just too much to expect. Um, I've seen reconstructions done by non Truing people who, you know, if you if you hammer out a model long enough, you can actually yank up the um, the explained variance if you're not trying to validate it, especially on independent data. So you can actually improve the model if you really, really try. But again, we're trying to get a model that's robust through time, so we don't want to overfit it. So we're not looking to get 100% of the variance explained. As I mentioned, the climate or hydrology data may contain errors. Um, so that's another source of uncertainty that's not related to the trees. And in the process that I've walked you through, I have mentioned some of the decisions we make, but some of them I haven't mentioned. In the detrending, uh, removing that growth trend, there are different ways to do that. Um, we can use different regression approaches. We can do uh, different sets of treeing data, and these all could produce slightly different reconstructions. So the bottom line is a reconstruction is the best estimate of past climate or hydrology. It's not the truth. We're never going to know the truth of the past, but it's the best estimate. Uh, and in some cases, um, we've done, uh, you know, what they do for, for climate model, we've done ensembles of reconstructions to see if we change, you know, how we do things slightly, how different is the reconstruction. And so we end up having a, an ensemble of reconstructions that we can then um, develop uncertainty bands around. Uh, so that gives us better information about the uncertainty, at least for some of these factors. So that's just something to keep in mind. I mean, I'm sure that you all realize that these aren't perfect, but this is, you know, truth, uh, sort of laying it out here. Um, these aren't perfect for a variety of reasons, but they still have useful information. What, yes? What do you find is the most sensitive input? In terms of the... It creates the greatest variance. You know what's sometimes the most, well, the question was what, what uh, factor can have the most influence on making a re one reconstruction different from another. Um, but one of the things that I sort of struggle with is the is the year-to-year um, -year persistence or the autocorrelation from, from one year to the next. The trees have biological uh, persistence where one year's growth is related to the year before is growth, typically, because of the storage of um, food in the tree. Um, and one of the things that we do is, that I didn't mention, is we move that persistence, that biological persistence. Um, but sometimes the climate system, particularly stream flow, has persistence in it. And so, and that persistence, actually, if you look at it in different periods of time, it, the, the, the value of the autocorrelation is different. And so it's hard to know what to do with that. With, with the Rio Grande and with the Colorado, the, the, the flow values at these gauges are not autocorrelated. There's no persistence. And so we use the chronology that have the persistence re removed. In the Klamath, it's a whole other story. Anyway, I, that, I've just been working on that, so I don't want to dwell on that. But that, that's sometimes the hardest. And that actually can have some difference in, in the reconstruction. If you're looking at the low flows and the persistence of low flows, they can be accentuated by the way you treat that persistence in the trees. For the Colorado River reconstruction uh, paper that we did in 2006, we did four different models. And for one of them, we used the chronologies that had the biological persistence, and we saw an overemphasis of these low flows. You could see that when you looked at the instrumental period for comparison. So I would have to say, in my experience, that's probably the one that can be the, that can have the biggest difference. All right. So here's an example of the Colorado River. These are all fairly old reconstructions. I mean, they're <laughs> the most recent one is 2007, but we've got Stockton Jacoby's reconstruction from the 1970s. Um, Michelson's was 1990. Hidalgo, it all was 2000. Can't remember. This is 2006. This is 2007. You can see they all go up and down together. They're all quite similar in the calibration period, and they all are slightly different. Um, 
mostly it's in these low flows, and this is Hidalgo's, which is, seems to... We tried to backtrack and figure out what, what those guys did to get that, and we couldn't quite figure it out. But these differences, the calibration data, uh, in many cases, was different. The selection of treeing data, um, these three papers used most of the same data. These two papers used different treeing data. The treatment of the data was different, and the calibration methods were different. So we did actually, uh, in this 2006 paper, um, we did try to tease out some of the, try to attribute some of the differences um, with the, some of the statistical methods that we used. Okay, one more thing, and then I think we're going to take a break. Um, I don't, some of you have been thinking about trees and water resources management, some of you haven't, and I've worked um, with a lot of water managers in Colorado more than in the Rio Grande, so I'm not as familiar with the kind of decisions that you're thinking about, or the challenges that you have. Um, but these are just some general ways that reconstructions have been used um, in the context of resource management. Um, at the very top, we have these longer records, and they're useful for addressing uh, the climate, the given climate or gauge records over a longer time frame. Um, they're a way to evaluate recent drought events. Uh, especially in the early 2000s, there were some questions in Colorado, was this climate change? You know, 2002, 2003, 2004, wow, this is bad. Is this, is this climate change? And uh, looking at the treeing record, um, it's obvious that that there have been droughts worse in the past. That doesn't answer it whether it's climate change or not, but it does say that, well, you know, it, it could be natural variability because we have seen this kind of thing in the past. Um, the reconstructions also provide information for understanding the, the, the range of drought characteristics are, that are possible, the duration, uh, the intensity that has occurred. And we also get uh, insights on low frequency variability. You know, if you look, if you smooth the 20th century record, you can see it's wet in the early part of the of the century, it's, then it's dry with the 30s and the 50s, and then it gets wet again. You know, how representative is that kind of a pattern when you look at the longer record? And then also looking at the reach sequence of, of wet and dry years. Um, I know in Colorado, uh, understanding those sequences, the, the, you know, some sequences of years where you just had average or below average years. You didn't have any wet years to refill those reservoirs, and just knowing that even though we didn't have devastating droughts at that period, we just didn't have very many wet years was kind of, a, I think, interesting for, for the, the reclamation people to look at, going, wow, you know, you don't have to have a major drought to have problems. You could have a long string of just not very wet years in a big system like the Colorado River to, to have an impact. So, so on that point, um, one of the concerns of the models that you indicated earlier was that it doesn't capture it doesn't. It doesn't capture the really, really wet years. I mean, it does, you know, the Colorado one does fairly well. Let's see if we can see that um, better. It's still not getting, you know, it's not quite getting these, these really wet values. It's getting the lower values much better. Um, so that is a concern to the, to the extent that those really, really wet years are really, really important. We're not, we aren't getting them as well. Colorado is a pretty big system. You have a much larger area sample, which has its own challenges. Mm -hmm. In smaller basins, um, do you, would you anticipate it being more difficult to get a reconstruction like that? You know, you know what do you want percent? I um, think versus you know, like how, 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 how do you feel that like that? So the question is, um, is it more difficult to reconstruct uh, streamflow for a smaller basin than a big basin like the Colorado River? A lot of it has to do with the nature of the gauge record. In a lot of the smaller basins, you have the flashier flows, and those are harder for the trees to get. Um, we do a pretty good, pretty good job with the Rio Grande, which I'll show you. We did, I think, as the one of the other workshops we did for up in Albuquerque, there was someone who wanted the Canadian River reconstructed, which we did, we did do, but we didn't. Uh, you know, it, it had some very high flows that we were just not able to get, I mean, really high flows. Some of the lower basin tributaries, the Gila and the Salt River, have some of those flashier flows that we're not able to get as well. Um, so that's probably the biggest challenge with the smaller basins, is the nature of the flow. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. So. Um, I'll just say a few things about the resources that are available. This is for 
Um, right now, this is for the Streamflow reconstructions, and your uh, the, the actually the page that has the agenda on it has the URL for this. This is something that Jeff Lucas and I started to put together when we started working with um, water resource managers in Colorado, and they helped us develop this website, which is basically an archive of reconstructions of Streamflow for for most of the rivers that researchers have done this kind of work. We're in collaboration with a lot of folks trying to get them to submit their data. So we have um, uh, basic information like I just went through. We've got reconstructions and the gauge data as well, so you can actually download the data, download the gauge data that we used for the, the model. We've got all the workshop presentations. We've done, besides four in New Mexico, we've probably done another dozen uh, in other places. So there are all of those, there's information on all of those on the website. We have applications, examples, actual um, concrete examples how Denver Water is using the reconstructions, um, how the Bureau of Reclamation is using the reconstructions, and a couple others in there. We've got, um, and some references as well. So for the um, Rio Grande, we've got a page that, for the whole basin, um, which talks about uh, sort of the background on the reconstructions, and then it has all this other information um, those are the reconstructions that we have right now. We did these for um, the uh, San Luis, um, no, the Rio Grande Water Conservation District in Colorado. And then we did the Odui ones after we had the workshop in uh, Albuquerque in 2008. And then Santa Fe reconstructions are from uh, Ellis Margolis, who was working with the city of Santa Fe. Um, so those are all, there's a web page for each of those, and there's the, the data as well. And there's also the references that are available. We're going through a little bit of a transition on this website. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not sure exactly where we're heading, but I'm hoping that we can actually uh, enlarge it so we get the monsoon reconstructions, also other water-related reconstructions on this page. Right now we have a separate web page for the monsoon stuff. OK, so I'm gonna, let's take a break now. It's uh, quarter after 10. Um, get up. Stretch, shake, get some coffee. If you have questions, um, those of you who are out there in Google Land, uh, we'll probably take maybe 10 minutes or so, and then we'll, we'll be back. All right, let's uh, reconvene for part two. Now, let's see, there was a question from the Google Crown that wanted, what, what was the question? The question was about um, the Rio Conchos. Um, will the Rio Conscious reconstructions be posted on TreeFlow? Yeah, that's a good question. I hadn't I hadn't done that, and uh, TreeFlow right now doesn't have any. Um, it's just for the U.S. But I I'll put it on um, the Rio Conscious reconstruction. I'll put it on, and I'll um, where shall I put it? We don't have a map for Mexico. Uh, get that get this person's um, email address, and I I will email where it is. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we work on the Conchos lab. Okay, um, I'll, uh, I'll figure out where to put it, and I'll email everybody where it is. I can't think off the top of my head where I'm going to put it, but I'll put it there, and I'll tell you where where it is when I get the when it, when I get it up. Okay, good question. Um, was there something else I had to mention? No. Okay, um, for the Google guys, we're on uh, slide 32, um, part two. Streamflow reconstruction for the Rio uh, Grande at Odui. Oops, I didn't <laughs> do the arrow thing. So this is, um, wow, well, the looks different in the PDF. This the the river is little dots, which shouldn't be there. Anyway, um, we did the reconstruction for the Odui after the uh, Interstate Stream Commission folks said, "Hey, we use Odui." Uh, we did actually two reconstructions. If you look at our tree flow page, there's two different versions. They're very similar. We just use different calibration series because the Odui gauge has lots of things going on that make it not natural. So for this particular ver 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 uh, version, we averaged together the tributaries in the Colorado that were relatively undepleted and um, for a sum at uh, Lobatos gauge. And then we added the gains between Lobatos and Odui. And it was a really similar series to the NRCS series. So that was the calibration series. And um, 
these are the chronologies that we used for the reconstruction. Um, Jerry asked me to talk about the screening process that we use. We have a lot of chronologies. How do we decide which chronologies to use? And we, uh, we first pick an area that makes sense climatically. Um, a lot of times we can, look, we can find chronologies that are significantly correlated with a climate a really long way away. Um, interestingly, and sometimes we're not sure why, but sometimes that cl the climate is, uh, is what we call it teleconnected to a different, there's a teleconnection between climate one place and climate in the other. And we don't like to rely on that kind of relationship because it's, can't, it may not be consistent over time. So we pick an area that is relatively robust in terms of a climate region. That area behaves the same way climatically, uh, pretty robustly. So our area was actually, um, I think this was the full, I can't remember if this is the full area. Uh, this area, the winter, it's the winter storm track we're seeing that's coming across, uh, hitting that region. Um, so yeah, this isn't, this isn't all of Colorado, this is just part of Colorado. We had a bigger, bigger set of chronologies. Um, so we have an initial pool, and then we look at the chronologies, and we correlate them with the climate or hydrologic record of interest. And we usually, I usually run correlations with um, different parts of that record to make sure that something isn't looking really different in one part of the record and the other part of the record, which is important for the, the assessing the if something is weird going on with the climate data too. So I look for a stability of that correlation over time, over the period of overlap with the true and chronology and the gauge record. And once I've gone through that screening process, I use that set of chronologies as the pool. Should back up. There's one other step, which is screening by length. So if we say we want, a chrono we want to do a reconstruction that goes back at least to 1600, that's the initial step, is just to keep in the chronologies that date back to 1600. So that may throw out a, a bunch of shorter ones. Or they start at 1600 and want them to go through at least 2002. That may eliminate others. And then we look at the correlations. And then we come up with a candidate set of pools. In this case, um, Dave Miko, my colleague, uh, did this reconstruction. He, these were all chronologies that were highly correlated with uh, the Odawi gauge. They were all pretty correlated with each other, too. So we averaged them all together to create a single um, average tree and chronology series that he, that he calibrated with the Odawi gauge. So a very, very simple approach to reconstruction for this process. And again, we're relying on this, the winter snowpack. And the winter snowpack you know, is sort of the, the Rio Grande Basin, a little bit larger than that, that we're, that we're drawing from. Where's the other double triangle there? The, There's the one. Is there another one? I don't really count six. Uh, there might be one. Is there one under the other? There, should, may, there may be one over. Yeah, I'm not sure. There should be 17. Yeah, um, there's really there's three of those that are kind of in the basin, right? The rest of them are all. Colorado River yeah, well, there's these three, and yeah. then, yeah, I should have put a be better scale on this, because I think a couple of these are up in the upper part of the Colorado River Basin. Well, well, I mean, not, the Rio Grande Basin. That's not the state. This is, this, this is not the state. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I just, yeah, I yeah, I know. I was, I was going, not, I should have put in something for scale. Yeah. Um, so here's 39 degrees up. 39. 40 would be up, you know, Boulder area. So you're getting... Certainly getting, you know, some outside of the basin itself, but these these are probably in the in the Rio Grande Basin. These are, yeah, this is these are a couple that are in the San Juan. They're at least all on the east slope. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Some of those streams to the right or to the over there. Yeah. Are, are those flowing into the closed basin up from the San no, Luis Valley? No. Uh -uh. Those, Those are all in the lower basin. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Where yeah. Is Del Norte on here? Yeah. I should have marked it. It's it's yeah, up it's here. Somewhere, somewhere up there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, the map map could have been better. <laughs> all right. So the de-trending is determined. The future is determined at an individual tree chronology, right? It's on an individual t tree basis. So we de-trend the the actual measurements from a single tree first. Okay. So that's all individually determined, but once it's determined, then you average. Yes. Together. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Well, I, I guess I keep seeing those cross section photos. Does that mean that that was the demise of the tree, or how do you? No, the cross sections are only from dead trees. Okay. <laughs> questions? Yeah, so you use the 17 um, treating data in the correct basin. They're not all in the basin. I should have drawn the basin itself. I think the basin 
is probably, I don't know if that one's in the basin or not. So we've got these in the basin, these in the basin. These are on the, the west side. But if you think about the way the storms come, come across, they're coming mostly this way, so that the same storms are affecting these trees and these sites is, is affecting this area. So they're all highly correlated. Oh, oops. <laughs> so this is what the reconstruction uh, looks like with the observed data. Um, the Odoe gauge, uh, the natural flows, estimated natural flows go, go from 1958 to 2002. I'm sure they go beyond 2002 now. Um, the reconstruction is in blue, the observed in gray. And we're explaining 74% of the variance here, so that's a, a good model, though we're, you see, you know, we're, we're not getting some of these higher flows. We're missing a few of the lower ones, too. Again, we're never going to have a, a perfect model, but this is a, this is a pretty good one. I'm um, just put this down here to remind me to tell you that I, I will be talking about the Rio Grande at Del Norte reconstruction as well. That gauge record goes back to 1890, um, so it's a much longer period for calibration. Uh, do you have any idea why you would be missing, like, 63 and 64 and then 72 and 73? Mm -mm. I mean, we could go back and look at these. Uh, sometimes it's the timing of the, of the precipitation. Sometimes it's the way that it came down um, that contributes to the flow. Maybe it, was a, Sorry. maybe it was a big summer that we didn't get. Yes? The Galloway uh, gauge record goes back to the late 1800s, well, 1890s also. Does it? So, yeah. I didn't get that from you guys. Yeah. Send it to me and we can recalibrate. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, the Odoe, but is it is it a um, the gauge record? But is it does it have irrigation and depletions? Sure, I mean, well, from the safety. Right, uh, but it, have you fixed it for that? It's not, well, it's just the actual observed record. So that's the problem. Is I'm not sure if we calibrate on that. And it has a lot of the effects of irrigation. If it would. Yeah, but Odoe supply also doesn't have the doesn't actually have the effect of irrigation. It's just a reservoir storage. And before 1930 something, there was no reservoir, so we have the match for Okay, if you guys you think... Just send it to you to talk to you about it. Yeah, yeah, we could look at it for sure. I, I wondered about 2002, it should be 200 something, and if you have it very high, then, then it should. This like your reconstruction actually looks much better than the actual. Yeah. So isn't that, isn't that natural flows? These are estimated natural flows, yeah. So they're the estimates that, um, th these aren't the ones that you gave us, but they should be really similar. So I think that value was a bit higher than it seemed like it should be. Yeah, it should be 200, 20, 250. Wait. That's the supply. But if, if, if I remember this one correctly. When was something we were talking with Dave about before, the assumption was in this that Colorado wasn't converting for agriculture carry through kind of a one-to-one basis oh. through the valley. Oh. Okay. Huh. okay. I, I do have a question about that because, you know, I've looked at the website, I've looked at these things, and I thought the natural flow was corrected. I'm going to take out the Colorado Tetian Associated Agriculture. That's it? Well, that's what I thought. That's, what I'm asking. that's a question I'm asking. Well, the, what, the, because, I mean, they've got massive agriculture. Sure. The, the, what we used for this estimate was all of the tributaries coming in. State of Colorado has pretty good records for all the smaller tributaries. So we had the Del Norte gauge, and then we had for the main, and then we had below below Del Norte those tributaries that are coming in, actually flowing north, I think, and then the ones on the east side of the basin. They had gauges for all of those. So there are actually ten gauges that we added together for the Lobatos value, and then we added the gains between Lobatos and uh, Odoe for this. But how did you account for? associated with agriculture in Colorado. We don't. We, we're looking at the Del Norte gauge for the main, and then, like I say, we're adding in these tributaries that don't have, that are, that are pretty much natural flows. North, so no right, right. There's one reservoir way up there, but it's pretty small. So, I mean, we can, if you could, if you have a better record, or an updated record, I'm sure you've probably updated it, right? I mean, I just, mm -hmm. yeah, from 2002. So you're taking Del Norte and then just assuming that it's hundred percent down to the state line. Right. Yeah, because we're just looking at we want the estimated natural flows. Yeah, yeah. So the trees aren't gonna get the diversions and depletions. So we can't. No, I understand that, but the rivers Okay. Another quick more general question. Until I was thinking the models would tend to under predict 
that I do see about it since the bubble prediction. Is there a trend or is it basically kind of it's positive negative bias? There's not, a, there's, not a, there's not really a bias. I mean, we look, that's one of the things we look at when the regression models. We we're, we're look to see if there's a bias towards errors at the high side or the low side, and it tends to even out. Right? It shows up in those, the, the highest ones. Do you do cumulative charts? I haven't, but we could. I'm just curious. Just, I mean, that's good yeah. yeah, we could do that. I'm sh yeah, I keep forgetting to say the questions. I'm sure that was not very uh, intelligible to those of you uh, listening in, but my apologies. So here's the, so there's the model. Um, my program to do this. There's the reconstruction, and I'm not showing you the, the annual values. I'm showing you a 10-year uh, moving average. So that each point here is the, that point there is 2000, um, because it's 2002 for the reconstruction, it's that year and the nine years before average. So it's a running average centered on the last year. And, uh, and that's the gauge record for comparison. So this goes back to 1450 and up to 2002. And I've looked at the record in, a, in, a, in different ways. And I don't know if these are the ways that are interesting or important to you. But just to throw these out there, this is a list of the five driest decades and the five wettest decades. So these are non, uh, did running running averages, but um, or running sums, but I've picked out the ones that aren't overlapping. So the, the driest is this 1576 to 1585 period here, which you can see. And this is a, uh, a drought that we see in many, many records throughout the Southwest and even in Mexico. Um, notable drought, a bunch of papers on these. Um, 1170s, we see that a lot of places, 11 uh, or 16, uh, 1770s, 1780s. 1620s, uh, uh, 1870s, and then the turn of this turn of the century drought was a pretty significant drought in a lot of areas throughout the Southwest. Um, the 1950s decade comes in as number six in this uh, ranking of the driest decades. So it's up there, but it's not quite in the top five. The wettest, though, on the other hand, we've got two uh, decades within the 20th century that are in the top five wettest. We've got this one here, 1912 to 1921, and this one, 1978 to 1987. So that's pretty notable. Um, and we see this in the Colorado River as well. The Colorado River, if you actually correlate the gauge records together, they're much more highly correlated than I ever would have imagined. I don't know if you guys have looked at that, but I was really surprised that, the, that it really, they're really quite similar. I mean, it's, maybe it's these major periods of drought and wetness that seem to correspond. But aren't you using Colorado data? Great, this model. For the Rio Grande? Yeah, I mean, most of your. Well, the, the, the reconstruction of the Colorado River is based on different data, for the most part. So when you're saying, forget the tree ring stuff, you're saying that we should be able to correlate natural flow of the Rio Grande with natural flow of these berry? Well, I've looked at the two records and they're. Stream flow, stream flow period. period, yeah. Yeah, the gauge records are more highly correlated than I would have guessed. Yeah. So I was going to do a comparison of them, and they're actually not that different. Such a, so much bigger base. I know. Carries all the way up yeah. The yeah, yeah. This is just another way to look at these. This, these are called box, box and whisker plots, and they're looking at basic statistics for different centuries of that record. Uh, these little squares of the median values for like the century, the 1500s. The box is showing you the, the uh, 75th and 25th percentiles, so that range. And then these are the extreme values, not the extreme single values, but the, the driest 5% and the wettest 95 percentiles. So you can just look across by century. Here's the 20th century. There's the median um, was higher than almost any other century. Um, this one came somewhat close in the 1600s. Um, this is sort of the, the middle range sort of moves around a bit. The other thing to look at are these extreme values, which in the 20th century were less extreme than any other um, century here, the, the, both, both on the wet side and the dry side, to the degree that the trees can get the really wet values in, in, that, in the context of this reconstruction. Just putting the 20th century in, into this uh, longer context. And then one other thing to look at 
is, is drought, duration, and frequency. Now, drought, uh, there's a gazillion different ways to define drought. And I'm sure that you have your definition for drought, your thresholds for drought. So the only, what I'm using here is a really simple threshold of, of the median. So I'm looking at single years and consecutive years below the median for that same reconstruction. This is for the entire reconstruction, which goes back to 1450, and then here's just the 20th century part up to 2002. And you can see that here's single year, two years in a row, three years in a row, four years in a row in that 20th century record. And then if we look at the longer record, we start to see these, these longer persistent periods, which is, you're going to see more extremes the longer record you have. That's just, you know, long, extreme events don't happen very often, so you have a longer series. They start to pop out. So in this case, we have a, an eight years in a row, 11 years in a row event in this, uh, in this record. Now, I'll mention this now and I'll mention it again. This kind of analysis is really sensitive to your threshold. You know, you're looking at a median value, this 11-year period. I haven't analyzed it, but I'm sure there's a few years in there that are not very far from the median. Um, there's also some probably shorter periods that are only separated by one year that's not very far from the median. So it's, it's really threshold uh, dependent, but it does give you an idea of, of of, you know, the 20th century in the context of the longer record. Ah. Okay. Maybe it gives us a little more confidence for next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to get, I'll get back to the real grand record when I, I'll talk about it um, with the monsoon record, but I want to talk about the monsoon record separately first. So for the monsoon record, for the reconstruction process, we need to use a slightly different approach. And this is what I was talking about in terms of the, the project that we've undertaken. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the monsoon first, which A, Dave could probably do a much better job at it, and B, probably most of you know this anyway, but just to make sure we're, we're on the same page, the, the monsoon occurs, uh, you know, in, in June. The onset occurs sometime in June. Um, and it's a bit earlier here than it is as you move further west in Arizona or north. Um, this high pressure at 500 millibars, so that, that surface of the atmosphere that's halfway between the, 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 the surface of the Earth and the upper atmosphere, a high pressure, Bermuda high, strengthens and moves in this way, so between June and July. And that switches, uh, causes the, um, the jet stream moves north, so we don't get jet stream type climate. Um, we get circulation around this way, around that high pressure, and it brings in Gulf of Mexico moisture and Gulf of California moisture, more to Arizona. This is probably more Gulf of Mexico to, to New Mexico. You also get some evapotranspiration from the forests in the Sierra Madres and some moisture from the southern plains. So moisture coming in with the, the shift in that, uh, the strengthening and positioning of that high pressure, the, the winds change and the vection of that moisture. Now this is a, a graphic that um, was the outcome of a monsoon research project, the NAME project, which was uh, looked at um, instrumental climate uh, in the monsoon region. It, I think it was a five-year project. I don't, were you involved with that at all, Dave? No. Uh, it ended a few years ago. One of the things that came out with was a monsoon uh, subregion domains, where they, they've sort of indicated areas, generally speaking, that behave more similarly than other areas. And you're probably thinking, well, the monsoon is so variable. Does this actually make sense? We know that you know, it was really wet in parts of northern New Mexico this year that weren't, it wasn't quite as wet down here. But in general, they, they seem to, on a, like a seasonal basis, they, they, they group together. And this, this result is based on a number of different kinds, not kinds, but different research approaches. So it's not just they did one kind of analysis and came up with this, but there are a number of papers that looked at monsoon regions. This boundary seems to me to be very robust between it. It's not quite Arizona and New Mexico border, but it's close. So there's a little bit of New Mexico in this region too. Um, when we look at the treeing data, I'll show you the network in a minute, but we look at the treeing data and we do a spatial analysis on it, and there's a division there also. It's really quite robust. Um, in Arizona, uh, the monsoon seems to be more tied to ENSO and in New Mexico less so. And there's probably other things going on there too. I think we still don't know a lot about the monsoon, so there's questions about that. But this is again the monsoon region I'm going to focus on within the larger monsoon region three. We have reconstructions for monsoon two, and we have a Four Corners reconstruction also from this project. 
Okay. You just have to ask. You say it's tied to Enzo. You don't have to go back. You say it's tied to Enzo. Are you saying it's much cooler, it's drier, warmer, it's wetter? Or? Um, in Arizona, uh, for the last 50 years, the instrumental data and some of the research that Chris Castro has done at University of Arizona has suggested a pretty strong link between and so uh, variability in both cool season and the warm season precipitation. So in Arizona, like here, when you have an El Nino winter, it's pretty wet. And his work was showing that when you have an El Nino winter, you tend to have uh, a dry summer influenced by El Nino. Okay. So it's an opposite relationship. And if you look at the climate data for Arizona going back until, into the 1960s, there is a pretty uh, strong inverse relationship between winter precipitation and summer precipitation. But if you look back before that, it falls apart. In fact, if you look at our reconstructions going back in time, the last half of the 20th century is fairly anomalous in that relationship. I haven't been able to see that link to the winter-summer link in the instrumental data here. I don't know if Dave has looked at it. But, uh, and Enso, uh, Chris Castro said his Enso work um, does not, did not extend to New Mexico, but he didn't find that relationship in New Mexico. So uh, he... Dave, just <coughs> Enso is not the ones yeah. No yeah. That's kind of that's pretty much what I found. Yeah. Is there does do people still have that? I know in Arizona it's a strong. I think that it's it's maybe getting weaker, but people on the kind of on the street you'd say, well, yeah, we had a wet winter, so we're gonna have a dry summer. Do they talk? Do they talk that way around here too, or is that not, so? There's nothing to talk about. <laughs> So here's, here's what you all know that, you know, this area, the southwest in general, has this bimodal precipitation regime. This is for Las Cruces, um, with a peak in, uh, in the summer, the monsoon, and also a peak in the winter, which isn't as peaky, but it's, um, it's important moisture for filling reservoirs and soil moisture. Now, when we look at the ringwets, these are just some blobs of uh, four years of ringwets. Um, and again, the early wood and the late wood, what we're finding is that the early wood uh, corresponds to the uh, the cool season peak and the late wood corresponds to the um, monsoon peak, which is work that uh, we didn't discover this work. There actually, that one of the earlier researchers in, in treating science uh, s sort of put out this hypothesis in the 1930s or 40s, and there's been work uh, probably since over the last 15 or so years, sort of looking at this. But our work is the first that's really developed a network of chronologies to see if we could actually do these reconstructions based on these um, sub-annual growth increments. <laughs> I'll stop doing that one of these days. So let me just um, walk you through these nice graphics. I had a graduate student who just finished, uh, Dan Griffin, who, who did some really nice uh, photographs um, to show this, which I thought I'd show you. But um, So here's one ring. There's the early wood, it's lighter in color, it's less dense, and it looks light because the cell walls are thinner um, and they're larger cells, so they come out looking lighter. The late wood is darker in color, it's more dense, the cells are smaller and the, th the walls are, are thicker, so it looks, looks um, darker. This part of the ring conducts water and nutrients, and this part is more important for structure. And then here's a sequence where we're looking at the different parts of the ring. This part, the, a wider early wood uh, corresponds to a wetter winter and a, a relatively narrow late wood is a dry summer. This one, narrow ring, uh, both parts are narrow, so dry conditions. These are both relatively wide, so wet winter and wet summer. And this one, uh, a dry winter and a wet summer. Um, typically, the, the, uh, the late wood is a smaller proportion of the, early, of the ring. And so we end up getting a, a, a noisier time series. There's, it, it's a little, um, I don't know how to say this, it's a, there's more variability. There's, we have to decide where, where to measure this exactly. It's not, not always so clear. So these are, these are it's a, no, a little bit of a noisier series to work with. Can I ask you, I mean, what's going on in, the, in that summer? I mean, it's that darker wood, but you have a difference in, in width for dry versus the wet and, and so what's going on there? Is it just a difference in, in timing, the time period of growth of these cells, or do we want a light dark? That's a good question. And we, you know, in, in terms of 
trying to define what's going on between the early wood and the late wood and those widths. You know, what we really need to do is to like wire up a bunch of a, tre a bunch of trees through a couple seasons to see when they're growing, and also look at uh, do and do checks on the on the on the growth. My graduate student actually did a project. Um, he had his hands in a lot of things, and he uh, he spent two summers go going from Tucson up to Mount Lemmon and sampling a set of ponderosa pine trees once a week, taking little punches, of course, to see what growth was occurring to try to answer that question. We don't know yet. Yeah, I wonder if Craig Allen was doing anything like that. I know he's been doing some abandoning the trees, but most of them have died. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. It's some. It's yeah. It, we we really should go back and do that now because we're doing this all statistically. We don't really know, you know, what the trees are telling us, and we could probably refine it. Um, the other question. This is what I was coming to the question you asked earlier about the variation with the wooden season mm -hmm. for the climate to be more where you have a peak of flash flood. Yeah. Um, there's been work with isotopes that has actually done finer resolution slices of uh, sampling. With isotopes, you can get from carbon and oxygen isotopes. You can get different. Um, uh, they give you different information about moisture variability in source regions. The trouble with the isotopes is that the, the analysis takes forever. <laughs> yes, Neil. How can you differentiate between these rings and the false ring? That's a good question. When we have a false ring, this is kind of a false ring will include the false ring in the late wood. So we, we actually did a bunch of experiments where we didn't include it and we did include it and did correlations with climate. We found that it didn't make a whole lot of difference, but it makes more sense in terms of we know that, uh, did we include no, I don't remember. I think we didn't include it because we know that the false ring will form in the four season, not in the monsoon. So that the, um, that, that false ring would be included in the early wood measurement. Um, but like I said, we did experiments measuring it both ways, and it didn't seem to make a lot of difference. But this was a, this we probably spent. Dan worked with a bunch of undergraduate students, and probably spent a good semester or two trying to find the most robust ways to measure these these interannual uh, ring widths to to make a really to be consistent in terms of what they were what they were seeing and what they were measuring. Um, questions when you. If you were to contrast this with a tree that's in the riparian, you know, it's in the river. Mm -hmm. Do you see it's called early wood and late wood? Yeah, you do. You see early wood and late wood. Um, I mean, they might be equal. I'm just curious. Right. You see early wood and late wood, but you see less variability from, from in the ring woods. You see them more. We'll call it complacent. The rings are all about the same size. Right. No, I get that. But yeah. Do you see this yeah. Late wood sure. Yeah. Yeah, you see it in, in all conifers when you start to get to things like oaks, it looks a little bit different. <laughs> the ring structure is a little bit different, but yeah. No, and so uh, then I have a question on that. If you know you have pretty much consistent water supply, have you ever looked at kind of like then temperature issues or stuff like that? Like, I mean, what's triggering that transition? And when is it in the time period in terms of like, time of the year? That's, a, that's, what, that's I have, I have a, um, a research assistant that's working on that right now. She's looking at... Is it uh, is it the conditions in the winter that precondition the tree to that false ring, or is it uh, is it is it right there in June that's doing it? We don't know yet. Yeah, we don't know if it's a latitude time issue. Oh, in terms of oh, in terms of the location or the. But what initiates this late wood? Yeah. Thing? Is it temperature? Is it sunlight? You know, what what's yeah. initiating that so that you have a sense that you call it wet summer? So I mean, a late person would say so that means it starts June twenty. First, right. right. Yeah. But no. I think that's what you mean. Yeah. We, we're we, talking different. Yeah. We're talking a different climatic pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We haven't we haven't refined our knowledge about that yet. That's definitely an area that we are doing more research on, trying to figure out what yeah what that actually means. What's what the tree is telling us at that transition? We so don't know. So, just so I'm clear in my mind, we, we're talking winter. We're really talking cool season precipitation going into warmer season precipitation, and that's that's really the two. Types of woods we're looking at. Yeah, we're talking about basically um, monsoon rain and non monsoon rain. So the cool season, I think we do November through April, but you could do it October through, I mean, if you want to divide it out, you know, October through May, even, although it doesn't do much in May. Um, yeah.
So these are just the correlations between, this is for a small study that was done for uh, southeastern Arizona, but it applies also to this area where we're correlating um, the TW means the total ring width. So a series of total ring widths correlated with uh, climate for that area for October through April here, the cool season, and through July through August. And so for just, if we measure just the entire ring, this is the correlation we get. Correlation uh, 0 to 1 would be perfect. Uh, this is like 0.65, which is pretty strong. That's where the below which there's really no correlation. It's not significant. So for measuring that entire ring, we're seeing the cool season moisture. We're not seeing anything significant for the summer. We measure just the early wood, so just this light part. We have a higher correlation with the cool season and, and even less significant correlation with the with the summer precipitation. If we measure the, um, the late wood, so this part here, we do get a correlation with July-August, a pretty strong correlation, but we also get a correlation with the cool season, which means that, that the two parts of the rings aren't, aren't, aren't independent. And so we take another step where we remove the dependence of the early wood on the late wood statistically, and we end up with a quite a high correlation with July-August um, in this part of Arizona um, with that what we call adjusted late wood, removing the dependence of the early wood on it. So this is what we're, we're doing um, for the monsoon. We're targeting that late wood and we're removing the dependence of the early wood on it. So this is the network of tree and chronologies that we collected for this project. Um, in almost all cases, they were, these were existing chronologies that were collected in the 70s and 80s. And we went back and we updated them, and we also measured them for early wood and late wood, which hadn't been done before. So for each one of these triangles, each one of these sites, we have two chronologies, an early wood chronology and a late wood chronology. And I think we also have the total ring with chronology. The Douglas fir are red, the ponderosa pine are blue. There's a couple other kinds of pines down here in Baja that were collected. This was a um, yeah, National Science Foundation project and I'll talk more about um, that project at the end. So that was the data set that we had to work with. Um, do, you know any, do you know any details about the, the data set in the, in the lower ground portion there? Like, it looks like some of it's in maybe the Magdalena, San Mateo, Black Range. Yeah. Centers. Yep. I know. I, I, I collected most of these. Oh, okay. So I know about most of them. I, we collected the. Or I didn't call. It, I didn't collect the Guadalupe ones. That was my graduate student. Um, or these. He did these. But um, we went out and collected this whole set in a week. Um, so you're basically up about eight thousand feet in there. Yeah, yeah. The Oregon Mountain ones were up. Um, there's two two sides of the Oregon Mountains. One was on Fillmore Canyon. Those were, ended up being worthless. And the ones on the east side were the Douglas fir, which ended up being useful. We learned that, um, interestingly, that the uh, there's different information from the ponderosa pine and the Douglas fir. The ponderosa pine, which we were sort of ignoring, um, ends up having more information about August, especially uh, as you get further north. So up here, the Douglas fir were not very useful for the monsoon. They actually got June, which up here, there isn't really much monsoon going on in June in that mm -hmm. northern part of the state. We should have been collecting more ponderosa pine up here. <laughs> And down here, we could have been using a little more ponderosa as well. Um, yeah. So it was interesting once we got this whole collection to see how this, the, the climate information from the trees is a little bit different. As you'll, as you'll see, and I'll show you, the one thing that we're not getting from either the early wood or the late wood or the total ring width is we're not getting September, which obviously can be pretty important. Um, but one part of this study uh, for one site down here in the Chiricahua Mountains was to look at uh, early wood and late wood widths for two species, um, some kind of a false ring index, which we're still working on, and isotopes. Um, we uh, sampled, uh, I didn't do the isotope work, but looking at the carbon isotope in the early wood and the late wood in two species. And we found in the ponderosa pine in the uh, late wood, the carbon isotope gives us a September. So, yay, <laughs> we're getting September. That's just for one tree, not one tree, one site, but uh, we're hoping to um, get another phase to the study, in which case we would focus more on getting that carbon isotope information for a bigger area so we can get September. Because right now the trees are, the ring widths, um, apparently by September they've, they don't really care what goes on. They're pretty much, they're done. 
Can, can you do some type of analysis of dead wood? That's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, well, you mean on trees, trees that were dead when you sampled them? Yeah. I don't know. I have to ask my, my isotope folks. That's a good question. I don't I know. Yeah, we've gone back and done isotope analysis on archived wood that was it was still sampled when it was a living, but it's been around for a while. I don't know. I'll find out. And these are sample sites, right? These are these are sites where we've sampled something on the order of 20 to 30 trees. Yeah, so each, it's not just a tree, but a, a collection at each of these sites. Okay, so here's just showing again that box, which I admittedly arbitrarily uh, um, located right there. I mean, it was centered on the Rio Grande. It was um, I was looking sort of at climate regions. To some extent, climate data, what the trees were saying. Um, so that's the area that I'm going to be talking about. We have another reconstruction for Division 5 again, which is kind of goes up in this area, north of Albuquerque down here. Um, and these are the cr three chronologies that, that were went into the, this is, we use stepwise regression in this process for the reconstruction model. And those are the three chronologies that went into the, into the model. After doing the screening process, I um, talked about earlier. And you notice we're getting June and July here and you're going, June and July, that's not, that's not the whole monsoon. That's right. Um, here's the, the monthly um, average precipitation for that box. And we're getting these two months, we're not getting August, and like I said, we don't get September with the ringlets. Um, so June and July account for about 55% or 55% or of the of the June, July, August total, so a little over half. So we're getting the onset, uh, the, the onset in the mid part of the precipitation season, not the entire season. However, um, this is June and July in blue and June, July, August. This is the instrumental data plotted together. And you can see it goes up and down together. I mean, I'm sure you know you can have a June and July that are dry and August that's wet. And things can, you know, can definitely change over August. So June and July not, may not be representative all the time. But the correlation is fairly high, even if the amounts aren't. So I'm, what I'm saying is that the, if we look at the ups and downs in the record, that's probably the most reliable assessment of this reconstruction in terms of the monsoon. And I should say if we go a little bit further north, um, we get August because we start to bring in the, some of the trees, the ponderosa pine up in the uh, Taos area that, that get August. So here's the reconstruction model. Um, instrumental in the gray, the reconstruction in the blue, and you can see it doesn't quite look as tight as the, the Rio Grande uh, street flow reconstruction. We're explaining 53% of the variance. So it's just not quite as skillful. And that's just the way it is. The monsoon is noisier. It's, you know, it's, we're, we're actually really surprised we could actually reconstruct the monsoon. People are saying, oh, you'll never be able to reconstruct it because it's so, dip, it's so spatially variable. You know, you can't, that's not going to work. But um, we are able to do it. Um, we get a lot of the ups and downs. We don't get all of them. And we're not getting some of these very high values. And we've talked about that. So that's what the model looks like. And then that's the full reconstruction with a 10-year uh, moving average in the dark line. That's one question in there. I was thinking, did you have a June-July time period? I wondered, A brothers, if they know. I mean, when we hear about the, the summer monsoon, a lot, a lot of times, it's that late June, July, and August time period. But the, what I always hear is, you know, if you, you're starting a couple weeks early, um, you can you basically look, look pretty reliably say that's going to carry through August. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's true or not. So if we're looking at this for the June and July time period, it should give us some confidence that August was likely. Well. So, 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 predictor, you're saying, okay. you know, that onset is, um, is a good predictor for the entire summer monsoon? That's a good question. I don't know. Just to say, see how we're going to have the first couple months. Yeah. Either a month and a half or one, one month. Yeah, so the question is, is the, is the onset a good, onset or the early part of the monsoon a, a good predictor for the rest of the monsoon? And 
Um, in Arizona, there's, there has been talk about that. In fact, some, uh, I think it was Salt River Project said, can you reconstruct the onset of the monsoon? Could you, if we gave you an onset date, could you use that as a calibration series? Because that gives us a good idea of what the rest of the monsoon may look, look like. So. I'm just thinking that with regards to water management that we need with the upper and newer brand. Yeah. We can make a big difference with regards to the overall operations for the year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a wiggly line. Um, again, the same uh, k kinds of analyses can be done. This is, um, yeah, this is a this is a shorter reconstruction. We're only getting back to um, 1659, which, you know, I was for me sort of the the late 1500s is a, is really a remarkable period of time for the Western United States, and I sort of like to get back that far, but we didn't get back that far. It's, it's harder to find old trees in New Mexico because of the fire regime. You know, I did work in Colorado, and the fire regime is not the same, and it's pretty easy to find old old trees back to the, I mean, not it's not easy to find 1,100-year trees, but it's easy to find trees back in the 1400s. It's very hard to find in Arizona and New Mexico, and it's I was a little bit surprised, but it makes sense because of the fire regime. The fire regime is natural fire regime. You get frequent burning. Um, and it also burns up the remnants. We didn't find a lot of remnants. I was really disappointed. But anyway, so it's shorter. So keep that in mind. I have a question. So when you're calibrating this, do you calibrate it to PRISM? No. Uh, oh, yes. Excuse me. Yes, that was PRISM data. That was PRISM data for that box. Right. Yeah. And so is it, are you averaging that whole box? And yes. Yeah. You, you don't like to use, let's say, harvested wood? Or was there vegas and stuff at Chaco Canyon? and? Yeah, areas that you could there there is a lot of archive wood. Um, there's some problem with using that in that we don't exactly know where it comes from. Um, but actually, at the Truing Lab in Tucson, there's a huge archaeological effort that's been going on for years. So there's quite a, a store of that wood. Um, there's another project. I should just as a side. There's a graduate student working on um, some collections in the Chaco Canyon area and the Chusca Mountains, and he is finding some really old remnants. So we're hoping to be able to do uh, reconstruction for that area of the monsoon um, going back. I think he's getting back into the 1200s. So that would be pretty interesting to see. And that, that's from wood on the ground and not, not the archived um, wood. So anyway, here's the, the same kind of a analysis looking at the, this is a 10-year moving average again looking at the wettest and driest non-overlapping decades. And again, a shorter period, so we're not getting, the rankings are, are not, uh, I'll show them together, but they're, think of them in the context of the, of the shorter record. 1950s is also um, one of the driest decades in the, in the monsoon, and it comes in as number two in this. And we have one period, 1912 to 1921, that comes in as the wettest. So we do have representations of, of uh, in, in the 20th century on, uh, on both those accounts. We don't see, we'll come back to this, we don't see the most recent drought uh, showing up in this ranking. So these two bumps here are actually come in at 6 and 7. So again, this record um, makes the 20th century look a little, you know, we smooth it this way, it looks a little wetter than it does drier, the 50s. And the third is being sort of combined in that averaging to some extent. And then the histograms of the drought um, duration and frequency using the median again as the threshold. Now there's a different message here. This is the 20th century up to 2008. There's the full period. We've got two runs of seven years in a row below the median, 1906 to 19, 1900 to 1906 and 2001 to 2007. Um, those are the only seven-year periods in the entire record. We have two six-year runs. But this period here was broken by 2000, or 2006 had a, was a hundredth of an inch below the median, so it just barely made that a, seven, a six-year, seven-year run. So again, this is really threshold dependent. But it gives you an idea to, you know, this may be, 20th century maybe is a little, 20th to 2008 is a little more representative of the, of the longer period than the, uh, the, um, the flow record. 2006 was below the monsoon this area? 2000, yeah, just barely. No, it was, it was, it was pretty good. Oh, you're talking June, July. June, July. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to, yeah. <laughs> you know, if it rained, if it was a wet August, that would have bumped this up, so. <laughs> Actually, it was, it was bad, it was big in Tucson, too, because I wasn't there, but there were big floods going through. Yeah, but it was in August. Yeah, yep, yeah. So those are the two reconstructions. Um, compared, you can't really tell much by looking at the wiggly lines. All You can draw some inferences looking at um, periods that are both wet and both dry uh, in the two records, just sort of pop out. And then you have periods where you've got wet conditions and mixed with dry. So a question on the go back? grand flow using percent of average Low and then the other one. Yeah, these are both percent of average based on the same period of time. Right, but they're different parameters. Right. This is uh, inches so and that's acre feet. Yeah, yeah. But percent of average allows you to kind of assess them in the same way. And the rate rent flow here again is Ottawa? This is Ottawa. Yep. You know, it's an interesting thing even if you look with the summer months and it's related, they, they seem to occur in the time periods I have is that. That Sonic Ashigi, which has a pretty long record, shows a, a pretty big signature of those summer monsoons. I mean, the correlations between Ottawa and, um, and Sonic Ashigi are not very good in the summer months at all. Hmm. Almost a lot of times when you have a good monsoon, uh, Sonic Ashigi is putting out a lot more water than you're getting in Ottawa. That's, that's, sure. that's interesting, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. And I, and I guess the, some of the rains have brought the elephant beat up. Well, that's in the upper base. That's yeah. Those are coming in all the well, not all, but the, about I would say seventy-five percent of the water that's coming into the river is coming in below. Huh. That's a different system. Okay, so I just um, for those of you that are following Google, I'm on part four, slide sixty-two. You're getting lost. Um, these are just some questions I came up with in terms of how can we, what might be interesting to look at in comparing the monsoon and Rio Grande streamflow reconstruction. So, are summer droughts longer than winter droughts? And I'm talking about when I talk about winter streamflow being um, a winter drought. How close they are the Rio Grande water year streamflow and monsoon precipitation? How close are the are precipitation and water year streamflow related? How often do low flows and dry monsoons occur in the same year? And how does the recent sequence of wet and dry years compare to sequences of years over the past centuries? So these are just some things that I looked at. This is just the two histograms put together. And there's not a lot here. It looks like, on average, sort of in, in general, the, low, the monsoon, um, which is the, this is June, July monsoon, runs are shorter at ones in, one and two pe uh, year periods, um, but we also have some, some of these longer runs as well. There are relatively more runs sort of in this middle sort of range for the, for the flow. These are the smooth reconstructions. Again, percent of average, the flow in blue, the June, July, and, and gold. And it's interesting to see that there's some coherence at this 20-year moving average. If we look at the, at the instrumental data for Odoe flow and June, July precipitation, they're not correlated. The correlation is negative 0 0.03, so it's basically zero. The reconstruction is 0.13 for the same period of time, but it's, that's not significant either. And if we look at the full reconstruction, it's 0.14, which, because it's a longer record, it's just slightly significant. But on a year-to-year -year basis, they're not correlated. But they look like, at times, um, they're in phase. So that's an interesting question. I mean, you kind of think about, well, what's controlling the two that could be synchronizing that, or is it just, you know, they become synchronized after a period of time? Some, time, some periods of time, they're not. So it's, for me, it's an interesting question. When we have these uh, long records, we start to see things that we don't see in the shorter records, and brings up questions, you know, how could they be uncorrelated on shorter time scales and they're correlated, seem to be correlated. I didn't run the correlations. You've got lots of persistence in here. Uh, correlations are for the 20 years? These are for just the annual. Annual. 
just saying that these are not significant, uh, but there looks like there is an association, at least during some periods, when you smooth them. There's been a discussion linking that to you know, the effect of the Atlantic multi decade loss of radiation. Show that in there, that's kind of what comes with the topic. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I've been tr I've been trying to figure I've been trying uh, one of the things that I was trying to work into this research was trying to figure out what actually controls monsoon precipitation. Um, and I talked to Dave Gutz, so I don't know if you folks know him, and he's been looking at that for years too. And he's like, I said, what about the Gulf of Mexico? It's got to be the Gulf of Mexico. It's got to be something in the Atlantic, right? He's like. <laughs> I don't know, Dave. If you've done any any work on the I've monsoon, heard most of it like that. The guy talked to Dave about that. Yeah, it's, it's like this guy. This guy, you know, some some uh, really well respected uh, climate folks say it's it's a chaotic system. <laughs> I don't like that. Is that for a year, year basis, or is that for a decadal basis? I mean, there's there's some people who believe that you know the PDO and AMO are very well, you know, what phases they are. Because they're decadal, even patterns like this. Right. Yeah. They give you no. Yeah. They give you no help in any one mm -hmm. year right. or in any one ninety-day period. Mm -hmm. But when you look at over, you know, you have one blow out there in the yeah. 1950s. But so so when when Gutzler and others say there is no correlation, I mean I would tend to agree from what I everything I've heard. Mm -hmm. But when you get into the decadal stuff. Are, is that, are they saying that as well, or are they just saying it from an annual and or short-term forecast kind of? I don't know if Dave has looked at the ammo. I know that I looked at it briefly and that switch points were not in the right place. Well, it's, it's not just the AMO, it's the, it's the combination AMO and PDO. It's those two in concert that seem to really correlate. Right. The, the AMO, though, the AMO will influence summer. Um, I think it probably influences the Bermuda high, and so that to me that is something that should influence the system. The PDO is more of a winter pattern. I'm not really sure how it would. I mean, it, it's a jet stream pattern. The jet stream is pretty far north in the summer. I'm not sure if it would, how it would interact with the. I mean, I know I know there have been articles that have looked at the AMO and the PDO together, but the honestly, the PDO is winter and the AMO is mostly summer. So some of those articles sort of gloss over the seasonal differences. I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm just looking like in 1950s, yeah. AMO is positive, right? Real positive. So it's inverse of what you're, of what you're seeing. Uh -huh. And I mean, I don't think that ever on its back. Yeah. Just in recent times, you know, it's the inverse of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it seems, I, I'll keep looking at this stuff, but my first analysis of this was that it wasn't quite right. It wasn't, it didn't quite, you know, the fact of the matter is it's probably a combination of factors, and if you could kind of combine them all, you'd probably get an explanation for a bunch of this. But it's not consistent and in sync all the time, and so it's at any given period, it's going to be a different set of conditions. So that's my hunch. Well, I, I guess I'm, I'm, this is really important. We hear a lot about the AMO PDO thing here about the decade pattern. But for planning purposes, I know. Right. I mean, if you have if you have indicators like that, mm -hmm. uh, clearly you know I mean, that that would be great. Right. Right. The question I have about AMO is, is the little bit I've read about it is there seems to be debate amongst people who do AMO what AMO really is and how to measure it. I don't know if that's debated. I mean, AMO the way the way it's measured is the what's going on in the North, from the tropics north. It's basically the average condition of the North Atlantic. Now, how that links to climate in the rest of the world is the question. Particularly if you're talking about the western United States, how does something in the Atlantic get propagated backwards? It probably doesn't, but it may be influencing the jet stream, which then propagates it the other way. So there's a lot that we haven't figured out on that one. I mean, there does seem to be correspondence. Uh, how that's happening is the big question. So, yeah, I know, I, I agree. If, if something is, has some persistence and it, it has some predictability in it, and that would be great. Um, and I know there's, there's been some people that have talked about, you know, 10 years ago, I think 
Julio Betancourt was, hey, it's AMOPDO, and you combine them and you get the answer. I'm like, mm, it's not that simple. <laughs> it sounded good, though. <laughs> okay. So this, this, now this is the Rio Grande for Del Norte, and this is a graphic from one of the papers that I uh, have provided with you, but um, it just is showing, I think it's, the results are probably similar for the Rio Grande Otoe, but I'm just showing you the really dry periods in the Rio Grande headwaters and in this June-July precipitation record, and I'm only showing you the dry periods, and I'm only, sh I'm not showing you, these aren't single years, but these are five-year averages. So I've smoothed both of the time series of five-year running averages, and I'm just showing you the flows in the 30th lowest percentile and the, and the flows in the 15th percentile. So these are the really low flows, and these are the pretty low flows. And then these are the likewise the, um, the 30th percentile dry June-Julys and the really dry June-Julys in the records. And just visually, you can see how some of them... Um, you know, there's, there's certainly not a one-to-one -one correspondence. The, it, the records aren't correlated, but there, there's a lot of overlap. Just because these things occur with some frequency, you're going to have times where they, you know, they line up pretty well. And maybe there is something that's synchronizing them that we don't know about. There certainly could be. In other, in other cases, you know, it just could be the, the way the system synchronizes itself. Um, so those are just the, the really dry periods. Um, yes. Why sometimes you use five years, some other prime ten years, some other prime twenty years? <laughs> it's arbitrary for lack of any other. I mean, it's not completely arbitrary. I mean, I, I, um, you know, five. I think at one point I was looking at NSAR frequency, so I used five years, <laughs> twenty years. Um, sometimes, yeah, it's it's pretty arbitrary. If if I had guidance from you as to what was important, I would I would use those intervals. Does it matter? Do you want to well, it matters to just be consistent. Yeah. Oh, okay. But some things you can't see when you smooth it, that you can see, you know, some things show up better when you, some decadal things you want to see, and sometimes you want to see shorter periods too, though. I mean, does it make sense to look at everything in the same frequency? No, not, but... I don't know. I try not to... part of the explanation as to why they're different. Right, yeah. I was just, if I... For, for graphical display, if I looked at individual years, it would be a mess. And if I looked at 20 years, it would be, it, I wanted to show a higher frequency, so. So if you do, if you do it in a 10 year, the picture would be not very good. It would be, it would be a smooth version of this. You wouldn't get some of these, <coughs> some of the details. Yeah, Connie, I was thinking about another part of this with we read headwaters and the monsoon precipitation. At least, you know, my experience with Craig up there and Steve Vandiver before it. Mm -hmm. you know, during the summer, they're always looking down at us saying, how come we're not getting those rains? Yeah. Because it's really infrequent that they, they get those large rains that result in real stream flow right. during the summer. Yeah. And so in trying to figure out how that, I mean, I guess you got one with the pre rent flows up there. You don't really have that summer signature. It's all the winter mm -hmm. portion of it, so that's a good uh, end member. Right. And then this other one down here is the end member flow of the summer months, too. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of do that correlation of inputs to the rear end basin to the, from the uh, winter flows and the related summer. All right, that was my thinking is that you have the surface water supplies, and then you have the local water, which is the summer water, and, you know, balancing those things. I did the same work for, um, for the Phoenix area for the Salt River Project, and they actually um, care much less about the monsoon there. It isn't, uh, especially in the Phoenix area, it really drops off between Tucson and Phoenix. And every once in a while, they'll get enough summer monsoon precipitation to fill their little reservoirs. But otherwise, they think they should be interested in it, but they're not sure why, because it doesn't really play a major role in their water management. In Tucson, they're more interested in the monsoon because it affects outside watering. Um, you know, the, the, the city, actually, these reclaim water now. So, I mean, even the, even the public tends to keep their, their drip system on when it rains. So. <laughs> but it does, it does show up in their water usage in, in for Tucson water that when, when you have a big monsoon, you have, you have less uh, use of water. Can I try to put that into context on the rebrand? Yes, because it's different. So the rebrand project down here is really very much dependent on supplying with big years of snow runoff. Mm -hmm. I mean, the summer monsoon, even a large one, you know, puts 100,000 acre feet of water in the reservoir, you know, and I mean, if you were, you know, raises it from 3% to 60%. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Even then, we get, 
if you get 100,000 of, of my suit, it can pull up order. Yeah, so it can, it can work right up to this way of order. It could, yeah, absolutely, it could, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, um, yeah but, the, but in the middle valley, when you get a big summer monsoon, it offsets a lot of demand mm -hmm. on a smaller reservoir upstream. And so that aspect of what the summer monsoon is doing relative to upstream storage and lease operations can be really important relative to heating the demand. Mm -hmm. yeah, a, good, a good monsoon for us is a few tens of thousands of acre feet. Yeah. A uh, good snowmobile here is a million. Right. Yeah. yeah. How much does agriculture um, rely on the monsoon? Do people rely on the I mean, rangeland probably. In, in the 80s and 90s, the monsoon was more of an annoyance. Uh, but in a time like this, it is. Very outside. welcome. Yeah. Especially with the groundwater starting to be less of a, I mean, sort of a, something that's a little bit more a problem. Question yeah. Uh, in terms of predictability, have you thought about um, doing these correlations? So, like, you've got them a certain threshold in the Sierra Madres that predicts you know, prop, that, 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 that there's a correlation that, that that's going to propagate up a similar kind of monsoon and, and continues to propagate up so that if you see some sort of condition, that, I mean, I pick the Sierra Madre, right. wherever you want to pick it in, the, in, in central Mexico, but that becomes an indicator that, you know, of, of you know, okay, about a week from now, two weeks from now, or this season, mm -hmm. we can anticipate some, you know, some, some, with some reliability that you're going to have, um, uh, you know, uh, above average monsoon, below average monsoon, certain amount of actual values. I haven't, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I'm not a, well, like an observ observational data meteorologist, climatologist, I kind of get into climate through the tree rings. I, some of the work that I've heard is that you can see this moisture building in the Sierra Madre. I don't, there was another theory about the Great Plains, whether the, the Great Plains gets moisture in the, from the low level jet in the spring and so you get a lot of greening up of the Great Plains before the monsoon season. There's sort of this turning, when that moisture turned off, the, the moisture turned on in, in, the, in the monsoon area. So if you have a, you know, sort of a, a, a very, um, if you have Forget how it went. If you had wet conditions, did it was there a correspondence? There was a correspondence between that. Dave, probably, do you know more about this? I mean, I'm trying to think about it. Yeah. There was a there was a Great Plains um, connection with with the uh, with the monsoon area. But I think the bottom line is that there, I still think there is not very good predictability. Even though there are these hypotheses about oh we should be able to see, track this moisture coming up from the Sierra Madre or we should be able to see this turning. I think it was that when the low-level jet turned off, then you could expect the onset of the monsoon because you didn't have that, that flow of moisture. Well, that's all climate. I'm talking about like if you go to tree meaning analysis, yeah. you see it in the audience, you have to start correlating the tree meaning analysis. Well, we'll, get, we'll, we'll, get, well, actually, I haven't looked at the monsoon. So like yeah. you see correlations. We're not, so we're getting presented between winter flows and summer flows. Mm -hmm. That's the good and the right. one. We'll get to the real conscious in a minute. So, so I'm obviously asking the question: Is there a correlation between south or south of our latitude right. wet periods with our with northern, but the southern latitudes? Yeah. So how are those have correlation? Yeah, I don't know if it's done has been done yet for the instrumental data, and I know for sure it hasn't been done yet for the treeing data. But we could look at that. We definitely could look at that. Okay, here's another way, uh, I guess my, my question that I was thinking about was, what about these sequences of a wet winter followed by a wet summer, or a dry winter followed by a dry summer, or the reverse? Are there patterns that we see in this? Um, so what I did is I, I'm looking at, um, uh, again using the, actually this, in this case I'm looking at wet and dry years that are in the wettest third and the driest third, so I'm not looking at the average years. I'm looking at combinations of high flow and dry monsoon, low flow and wet monsoon, wet, wet, and dry and dry, and looking at it by 50-year periods except for this one. So I look at, you know, certainly you can see differences in these patterns, but there's not, there's not, you know, and these are years. There's not a message here that says, oh, we tend to have a dominance of opposite conditions or shared conditions. It's variable over time. And in, in all of these cases, uh, these patterns are not significantly different from random. The biggest uh, sort of 
difference you can see is in the 1700s, you had a much higher proportion of uh, shared wet and shared dry seasonal precipitation and stream flow. So, I mean, if anything, something might have been going on different here. Is that the, you know, the, the, the cooler time period, right? The, maybe ice age time period somewhere? Or? I don't know. Theoretically, yes. I mean, in terms of a hemispheric, but I don't know about here. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, we see here the earlier half of the 20th century. We see this. This is the the big peak of the the early sort of wet period, the pluvial period, particularly for stream flow. But also, we had wet monsoons. Um, and this is look. This is covering uh, the 1950s period. I think that spikes from that. Did you look at it as a whole from this five fifty year period? I could. I could. And I uh, hmm, it seems like I'm, I might have done that somewhere, but I yeah. Is this um, you're saying flow and monsoon different in monsoon? Monsoon and monsoon. These are for the same year, though. So I know, but you have a wet winter and a wet monsoon in the monsoon sample set, right? Because this is looking at snowpack versus monsoon, right? Right. But have you done it looking at? Monsoon, monsoon. You mean the monsoon in the following yeah, year? Yeah, well, well, monsoon meaning southern latitudes, winter, early wood, late wood. Mm -hmm. So you had an early wood that had wet conditions, so late wood that had dry. Oh, within the same, yes. but yeah, no, I haven't. So for looking, instead of comparing it to stream flow, doing a cool season precipitation reconstruction the for the same area. Yeah. No, I haven't done that. I haven't done that. The other thing that I could do is, given a given a sequence of, um, uh, I mean, I could do the probability of a given a sequence of high flow and dry months, and what's the probability of the next year? I could you could do those kind of numbers with with this as well. Yeah, I guess the reason why I bring it up is I'm thinking about antecedent conditions. Right. Really wet. Yeah. Yeah. Does that? Yeah. Here. Does that Actually, for to yeah, for the above average monsoon here. Yeah, for the paper. There's the the 2013 paper. I think we actually do do that for the instrumental data. The yeah, and there isn't a correlation. And there's no, and there's no correlation. Okay, I'm getting close to the end. I'm I'm getting I'm getting near the end of, of the time. Here I am throwing another different another way of looking at the this information. This is looking at sequences of um, wet. This is the wettest third, driest third, and the middle values just for some different 15-year periods, just to show you the, the variability. This is the June-July on top, what do we flow on the bottom. This is the 1907 and 1921, that one of the wettest periods. You can just see there's just incredible, you know, really great wet period for the, for the flow. Um, nicely spaced dry conditions, but predominantly wet for the monsoon. Here's our worst uh, drought in both seasons. It's the 1659 to 1673. Uh, just this intense period here from about 1663 to 1699. Here's just a set of opposite conditions. In both cases, these 15-year periods were, were just about the same. They're about 102% of average. But you can see the arrangement of those uh, conditions were really different from year to year. And this is recent conditions. This is the Del Norte flow because I didn't have it updated, um, and that's the estimate for 2013. And this is June-July precipitation. There's, there's June to August. This is instrumental data. So this is what um, the record looks like. I mean, if you wanted to compare this kind of a thing with this worst case, that's probably as close as you could get. So we're not quite seeing these kind of conditions. We're seeing two <laughs> chunks of back back both season dry conditions and since uh, the 2000s. And then this is Did just... <laughs> I'm surprised 2006 looks like that, of the June, July, and June, August precipitation. I thought you guys just said 2006 was... Because in August, mm -hmm. August, September, yeah, we, we got, well, it's, it started in the middle of August, I think. Yeah, I think so. 2006 is what? Yeah, that, that 
Right, but before yeah. then, it was not. Right. June, July, I'm surprised it's considered wet. Well, it gives me a bit, which is untrustworthy. Yes. Yeah. But then in 2008, it went. Again, you know, this is the region that I picked, which might not be the same region that you're thinking. Mm -hmm. And these are thresholds. So, one way or another, they, they could shift a bit. But in, uh, if you look at like O2, what was it like down here in O2? I mean, was it O2? It was dry. It was like super dry. I mean, it didn't rain. Okay. Let's move on. I'm looking at the clock. Oh, we have 10 minutes and we haven't gotten to the real contest yet. Do we have the room longer? <laughs> They're going to kick us out. <laughs> we're, no, we're going to do more of that. We'll do more of that. This is, this is just, I won't, you know, you guys know this. These are the conditions for 2012 and 13. These are, these are for forecasts because I couldn't find the data. But, I mean, no news. These are both really dry years in the in the Rio Grande. This is precipitation for uh, June through um, end of August last year, and this is for this year, which is, and these are actual, uh, I think this is in inches. So kind of, that, that seems like reality to you. Um, I mean, just one thing, um, yeah. you going to, just to, thinking about this, you know, that Colorado um, using Del North in some of these things, it might be better to use the bottom region. In some of these, just because of the, even for Colorado, the um, Anthony, the La Nina, El Nino um, correlation really isn't there. And we know we've been looking at this in the last 10 years. If you look at Colorado, they've had you know, a lot of years that are pretty close to average. Right, yeah. And where if you go down to Ottawa, yes. what's coming off yeah. the San Juan headwaters and the Sangre is yeah. different. I need to get the updated data from you guys. And yeah, and the, <laughs> that's the only reason I'm showing because I was like, oh, but I can't show to 2013, so I know that. yeah. But I yeah, that's a good point though. And I didn't I know that they are different, but I didn't realize yeah, it makes sense to me they're that different. Um, Elephant Butte, you know you know all that. What's what's interesting to me though is Elephant Butte has been really low in the past. I mean it's been really really low in the past, right? Um, <laughs> this is the instrumental data. This is just my. Okay, where I'm going with this is that the, at the reconstructions end in 19 or in 2002 for the for the stream flow and in 2008 for the for the precipitation. So I you, you can't quite compare the reconstructed uh, reconstructed records with, with with the with the years that they don't over that they don't include in the calibration. It's not it's a little bit apples to oranges. So I wanted to look at the instrumental data first in terms of putting the the last. 10 or 15 years into long-term context. So this is the instrumental data, and I'm going to be using Del Nort because it, I have it up to 2013, but I could do it for Odawi if I had the data. And June, July, and these are again looking at wettest, driest, and in between. And just looking at some of these runs, I mean, you know, low flow six of seven years in the 1950s, 15 years with only two high-year flows. You know, we're not doing a whole lot better here. 14 years with only two high flow years at, at Rio. For the precipitation, um, this was not good. 11 years, none of them wet. Um, 1930s, um, five of six years were extremely dry. And then here's a 16 year run with only two wet years. So I also did uh, moving averages of, of this information, trying to rank you know, 10-year periods up to 15-year periods, trying to see if the most recent 10-year period, 15-year period, floated to the top, and it never did. Um, for stream flow, um, two of the, in the last 15 years, uh, two of these periods came in at second or third for stream flow. The 60s, 50s and 60s were still lower. And then for the uh, precipitation, you know, we're you know, in this in this analysis, which admittedly is June and July, we're still pretty far from the severity of the 1950s, from what I can tell. So uh, the results were pretty similar for June, July, August, in terms of that. I mean, you know, our recent any looking at any 10 to 15 year period in the last 15 years, you're still behind 1900s, 1930s, and 40s, and 1950s in terms of average values. 37th driest in 11 year periods. That was the good, the best I could get. So if we think about 
okay, the 1950s is the it, for Streamflow is is the is the really the big event for the for the 20th century. And we look at this again, we can see that it comes in as sixth. Um, and we're not that far from this. So the Rio Grande is, you know, we can't say it's the worst drought there's ever been, but it's in the context of this longer record, it's it's up there. In terms of the um, precipitation, though, this ranks number two, but we're still a ways from that severity now. So, and this is also a shorter record. We don't get, we're not getting the late 1500s, which I think would probably bump this down a bit. So that's the best. The context question is always hard. People always want to know, well, how does this drought compare to the one, you know, to the longer mm -hmm. record? And you go, okay, how are you defining drought? <laughs> and how how can we actually connect what we're seeing now with the with the reconstructed values, which um, you know reconstruction ends and before these the, so many of the drought years we're experiencing now. This, this makes me think more about yeah, I mean that aspect of or with the the Del Norte correlation the auto week. Yeah. And seeing how that would, yeah. uh, might change things up. Yeah, yeah, we should look at that. I also I would love to get that reconstruction further back in time. Okay, very fast, the Rio Grande and Rio Conchos flows. And um, this is comparing it with the, Rio, with the headwaters, but it would be interesting to compare it with the precipitation as well. So Del Norte gauge, this is the area I'm looking at. This was um, precipitation data from uh, Art Douglas. I don't know if any of you know him. He worked for a long time. He was a climatologist that worked with Mexican climate data and tried to clean it up and... Uh, get it in a useful format, and he did some regionalization and, and defines this as region five, which pretty much coincides with the Rio Conchos headwaters. So there were some gauge records on the Rio Conchos, but they just were not very long or probably very reliable. So there are there's a collection of treeing data in Mexico that I've not collected, but my colleague. Um, Dave Staley and uh, uh, colleague uh, Jose Villanueva in uh, Mexico have collected, and they have done early wood and late wood for those chronologies as well. But the best we could get was um, October through July. The trees down there don't see the heart of the monsoon because I think they're probably, they have enough water, and more water doesn't help them out, even though the monsoon is more intense down there. We really need to work more down there, figure out if we can get that better. But looking at percent of average, um, if you do water year, precipitation for this area and you do October through July, it really it varies pretty closely. So if we use this as a proxy for water year, if we consider it as a percent of average and not magnitude, we can probably do some comparisons. And then if we throw the Rio Grande water year flow on top of that, um, it doesn't look very correlated and it's not. Oops. And then the only thing I'm going to show you which is in the paper is, oops, oh, one more other thing. These are the models. This is the reconstruction in the dark line and the observed in the gray line for the Del Norte, and then here's for the Rio Conchos. Again, this is only explaining about 50, 54% of the variance, so not as skillful, but still. This is the one result that I'll show is even when you have, and this is a smooth, the 20 year filter, 1649 to 1993. And um, I'm just highlighting the periods where you have drought in both watersheds. These are uncorrelated. Um, they don't look like they're correlated. There are periods when they're somewhat in sync. And just the message here is that yes, you know, just because of you know how things synchronize at points in time, you can have uh, dry conditions in both basins. But if you think about what would maybe control that, it's hard to imagine climatically something that would link them. So I think that's pretty much it. Just summary stuff, which is all the stuff we've been talking about. I'm not going to go over that. These are the two papers that I've included uh, reprints in your um, packets if they're interesting to you. I, our color copier wasn't working, so they're not in color, but they are available as PDFs. There's a couple color graphics in them. There's this article also, which I had a couple, um, I didn't have very many copies of it, but it's an article that we did after the last workshop in Albuquerque where the New Mexico Tech people put out this uh, nice publication, and we did a rec did a, um, article on the, this is the Division 5, June, July, August reconstruction with the Odoe gauge. 
So that's available online. And this is the web page, part of the web page for the monsoon project. And in this, on this web page, um, the publications and the data that I've been talking about are available. So the uh, the monsoon reconstruction is available on this page. Uh, this and I'll make the whole document available to you, and it has the links on it. Also talks more about the monsoon project itself. So I'm done, and we have three minutes. <laughs> I don't know. They're not going to kick us out, are they? <laughs> so I've been, uh, you know, these are when I, you know, I, I came from. Um, I spent some years in Colorado working with. I mean, I, I'm a cli I'm a paleoclimatologist. I'm not a climatologist. I'm not a hydrologist. I have no no experience at all in water management. And in 2002. I had water managers in Colorado come to me saying, how often do we get a low flow like this? And so I started working with water managers and learned a little, like, enough to be dangerous. <laughs> and I, all I knew about was runoff, um, stream flow. That was the name of the game in Colorado. Not really much. Uh, n n nobody cared about summer precipitation. So when I came to Arizona, I was like, oh, there's this thing called the monsoon. And even in Arizona, like I said, the monsoon is a funny thing. People seem like they should care about it, but they're not really sure what they should do with it. Um, and it seems like when we went to New Mexico the last time, people were saying, yes, the monsoon really is important here. <laughs> and it's like, oh. And, and, and uh, Ralph, has, you've talked about some of it, why it's so important. And so um, after that workshop, I was thinking, well, maybe, maybe we should talk more about this. and. Um, see if there's something we can do. I'm, I'm getting some ideas about other things we can do with this reconstruction and the Rio Grande. I'm looking at the cool season precipitation as well. So I'd be interested to hear about more ideas or more questions you have or more, what if we looked at it this way or things like that. So, yeah. I just have a couple of things that relate to the state of New Mexico stuff. But, uh, like in the middle Rio Grande or the summer monsoon with regards to uh, demand management for the through the Mill Valley, and we have $800 million worth of infrastructure not been put in in the last 10 years wow. uh, related to ESA issues or cities putting in certain water diversions and so on. And, um, and and the aspect of if we had some more predictability with regards to the summer monsoon of when it might come on yeah. and start and how strong it might be, mm -hmm. it would significantly change when we had confidence. Would significantly change some of the water management um, activities that go on earlier in the year, mm -hmm. and uh, for you know, for endangered species, for targets, for irrigation. Um, but we don't have any ability right now to get the you know, confidence right. in what might happen right. in the summer long soon. So you just can't. You know, it, it's unpredictable. You can't manage where you have to assume it's average or less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean we can we can. Look at the statistics of the sequences and do some things like, given this sequence, here's the here's the probability of this outcome in this year. I mean, just based on the past record, if you have, a, you know, if we can find those kind of types of examples where we see a, you know, you know, we see this often sequence where you get this, you know, wet dry pattern and then the the following year is this. Um, maybe that can help. I have a graduate student that's working on a uh, a visualization tool for um, California Department of Water Resources that's it's different. It's looking at Colorado River flow and Sacramento flow, but looking at, again, sequences of if you have this sequence in the Colorado and this sequence in the Rio Grande, what is, you know, if, give me a histogram of what the fourth year looks like. So we could do something like that that would give you an idea just based on history. Right. If there is, you know, what, what the spread of those, the following season is. And whether, you know, maybe that would be, maybe there's a tendency and maybe there's not, but at least we could look at that. That'd be great. I mean, the other thing we're looking at is the state water plan. And we have all the, you know, the uh, West Wide Climate Assessment and, the, and basically downscaling of uh, you know, the GCM results to New Mexico and other places. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then trying to carry that forward for it, for some kind of predictive mode, right? Right. But every single one of those. Um, um, Model runs have some, uh, you know, it's all has some climate change forcing it. Right. And we're thinking, well, you know, given that we, that we see the variability of these kind yeah. of uh, these cycles that you that you show in there, 
you know, having some kind of a baseline that could be developed off of the triggering data to mm -hmm. say, well, you know, here's what you might expect the kind of variability to occur naturally, and then overlay that with uh, you know, some of the, uh, the, the climate change. Right. Yeah, there's actually a little bit of work that's been done on that. Um, there's a hydrologist named Manu Lal who's at Columbia. Okay. And he's done, uh, he, he was sort of playing around with it for the Colorado, looking at the, the spectral characteristics of the time series and the, for the triggering data, you know, so you can mm -hmm. get the, these frequ different frequencies and then building that into the future with a model. Oh. And, uh, you know, he didn't, he didn't publish that. Right now we have a proposal then to work on the Missouri Basin. It's the same idea, though. It's, it's this, uh, yeah, it's, this, it's um, uh, spectral modeling and forward, forward modeling. So we should we should keep on in touch with that because uh, we we have no idea if we'll get funded for the Missouri stuff. But again, it's, it's the same approach that is what you're saying is that let's take what the information we know, you know, from the treeing record and use it to project forward as sort of a natural baseline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's yeah. Okay. I'm glad to hear you're interested in that. I'll I'll tell him that and we'll. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Other ideas? Yeah. So I've got to believe we've done some of this for Gila. For the Gila? I have it with my colleague Dave Miko has. Yeah, he, we have uh, actually in the tree flow website. There's a, I think it's the upper Gila. Is there a gauge at Solomon? I think, which is a longer gauge. There's a reconstruction for that. Um, we actually just worked with. Uh, this is a. This, this turned out to be more more sensitive than I thought it would be. That uh, upper basin wanted to know what the estimated flows were at where the Gila ran into the Colorado River. <laughs> For reasons that have to do with the Colorado River Compact, and we're, we're actually we're able to do that, uh, even though the flows are basically non-existent now on the Gila from Phoenix down. But uh, there was a paper, a, a University of Colorado student had a paper that came out on that. Um, but Dave Miko is the guy that's been doing most of the work in the Gila and the Salt. But I know the Gila is there's some things going on up there that. Um, are of interest, probably. Well, there's things of interest, but there's also, I mean, that's a basin that's going to be more influenced by monsoons. Yeah, I don't, yeah, the flows of the, I don't know if you're talking about the Gila River or, the, or that area, the flows are still uh, winter, uh, winter precipitation dominated. Um, I did a little work looking at, um, uh, Monthly stream flow and monthly precipitation, and and where the correlations were. And for the Gila, for the water, your flows are still largely dominated by cool season. The, I think I was using the gauge at um, I think it's Solomon, the longer gauge that's near the headwaters. I think. I think it's I was wondering if there's a difference between Yeah, it was pretty high in the headwaters because it was a gauge that hadn't didn't have. Didn't well, have too many divisions. Yeah. Well, you know that. The last 15 years, it seems like the hill really runs and you get wet, wet, or you get wet months. Right. The salt, the Salt River Project folks um, capture the Gila, the Salt Gila Tonto in their reservoirs, and they, uh, yeah, 2006 was one year where they said, "Wow, the monsoons filled our reservoirs." Uh, so it's so a really good monsoon, and that I don't. 2006 was not a wet winter. Couldn't have been any wet winters. Um, so it really did have an effect. Um, we talked to them, and they're like, "We should, yeah, we should care about the monsoon. They should talk to you guys. You seem to have more reality on the horns of the monsoon. It's an urban system. They're they're also mostly managing. I don't know if that makes a difference or not, but." What you're saying? Well, I'm thinking more about New Mexico. I care less about Arizona. Right. Right. I know. And so, like this last kind of bout of monsoons, the ones that we saw, that's the kind of project that's being contemplated is to scalp those flows. And so, if we get a sense of what the monsoons really are, thousand year time frame, then we're starting to get a better sense of, you know, what kind of is that 14,000 that we're going to go after. Right. So it seems like one of the thing one of the things that would be interesting to know first, and maybe the work has been done, is if you looked at the if you the, looked at the gauge records now and the instrumental data, how often does the monsoon make a discernible whatever that is difference to the flows? Sure. Mm -hmm. And then with that information, go back in time and see 
you know, you probably identify some thresholds where the monsoon does make a difference. And then with the reconstruction, go back and say, how often do we hit that threshold where the monsoon makes a difference? That we could do. That we could do. We have the flow reconstruction. Um, we could do the monsoon. Yeah, we could do a monsoon. That area. I wonder how big of an area. That's, you know, that's an interesting area because it's kind of transitional between that boundary between Arizona and New Mexico. Which makes it interesting scientifically, but maybe complicated in terms of, yeah. But we're not very sure. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, not that it's a state line. It's it's a it's sort of a <laughs> it's a climatic boundary. <laughs> so that that would be interesting to do. That'd be interesting to do. Yeah. Yeah. Watching, yeah. And they asked that uh, you know, they're getting parts of this, but they wondered if the, if the Google portion of this is going to be available somewhere online. But if the actual workshop that is recorded on Google can be viewed. Yeah, we'll um, send out another email to everybody who registered or who is interested, and um, we'll send it'll be posted. Yeah, we'll post the PowerPoint and we'll post the YouTube. It'd be interesting to see if, yeah. If whoever's emailing you, it asks them how the experience was. I'm sure that the conversation is frustrating because I invariably forgot to repeat the questions. <laughs> so it was like, the, <laughs> did someone write all those questions down? <laughs> so you know, again, folks in Rio Grande, I understand that, but Pika system. That's a system that, yeah, I mean, it's 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 snowmelt driven-ish. Mm -hmm. But it's really impacted by monsoon. Mm -hmm. And its storage levels are much lower. So a big, you know, even a big storm can have a dramatic impact in terms of how that system operates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it possible? You know, do you, it, does this just end at the Oregon? And I saw you had a couple of samples, maybe one sample site in the Sacramento's. But thinking. We can we can there's, actually look at the three, papers. There's three kind of major ag areas where you're gonna have water management. Right? Here you're gonna have Little Pecos, and you're gonna have Eastern New Mexico. And so, okay, Eastern New Mexico, I'm just gonna cross an office. There's no trees there. Right. So, but but the Pecos system is interesting because you have the Sacramento's, mm -hmm. and the Sacramento's feed the Artesian aquifer, which is pretty major as aquifer world-class aquifer, but you also have surface flows that really make a difference in terms of you get a 20,000 acre foot storm, that, that changes the dynamic, particularly down south. Mm -hmm. So have you guys ever thought about talking to the, the Pegasus folks? Yeah, actually, I, I gave a talk to, um, there's, there's water judges in the state, right? There's a, are they called water judges? There, there's like a, a wa water court. They have a uh, judges in each district court that right, sign or cases. Right, and they have a, they have a meeting every year. And a couple of years ago, I did I did give a talk to them, and there was I can't remember the name the gentleman who looked over the Pecos area, but he was interested, and I couldn't get back to him right away. But I did actually look at the feasibility of doing a Pecos reconstruction for streamflow, and it is possible. Um, so yeah, I mean there's. It, I mean it fit in the ESA, it fit in the irrigation ops, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It's fit in that management because you have a real strong correlation reset that impacts the power system there. So would you be most interested in the flow record or the a monsoon reconstruction of both or winter cool season yeah. precipitation, all of the above? Well, I mean, I'm, I mean. <laughs> in a perfect world. The conservation bureau, but I mean, <laughs> work with Pecos a lot. I mean, there's a lot of controversial issues there. I mean, I'm sur I'd be really surprised if. The you know, kind of lost counterpart part over there would be you know, adverse to having that kind of longer term record mm -hmm. to be able to start modeling some of the way we manage that system. Mm -hmm. That's so when we talk about monsoon, I mean, I kind of feel you know there's really good things to think about in the lower Rio Grande, but monsoon feels at best. I mean, you know, get at best 100,000 acre feet. But you get a good snow year, you get a million acres. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, snowpack, right. snowpack, snowpack. Mm -hmm. But on the Pecos, it's a little different. Yeah. Snowpack is really important and can make a big difference to get, get late snows. But monsoons can make a big difference as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that they have how, you know, how far back they have good um, 
reconstructions that go back to. Yeah, I don't think this the work has been done. Yet. So, for example, how would that play out? So, you know, when, when you look at the Pecos River Compact, the Pecos River Compact is based on data from 1919 to 1996. That's the period of record. Mm -hmm. well, how does that period of record stand up over right. this period of time? Right. Well, we do have, among other things, I am trying to do a, a, a second phase of this monsoon project with the National Science Foundation. So if I get my act together to submit a proposal, one of the things we want to do is work more with the isotopes so we can get the rest of the season. Um, we also want to integrate the Mexican chronologies, the Mexican data, with our data set and do the same data treatment in terms of the adjustments that we did to separate the early wood from late wood for the Mexican chronology so that we have a Mexico, a, a real monsoon data set. We didn't do Mexico because we had colleagues who had already done Mexico and we wanted to, like, you know, we don't want to step on their toes while we develop this data set, but now it's time to move them together. So that would be part of it and also more sampling from what we learned in terms of the ponderosa pine getting us more into the season. So part of that proposal would be justification which NSF actually does say they care about. Broader impacts is what they call it. <laughs> I would, this one was funded by the Paleo Climate Program. So that's usually who I go with. Um, it's really competitive now because NOAA doesn't fund paleo climate field work and there's really no other pot of money to go for. But um, folding in the needs of the Pecos region and, and some of these other ideas would really uh, strengthen that proposal. So, I regret that. I think you're really interested in that. Oh yeah. 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 I regret that academically our funding cycles are not very. I mean, this is like we'll put the proposal in this fall. You know, maybe we'll hear about it next summer, and then maybe we'll do the field. That's why it takes so long to get this stuff done, which is frustrating because you guys are like, "Here's a great idea." You know, while we're thinking about it, can you get us the data? It's like, well, five years later, <laughs> here it is. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and there's so many good questions. Um, I appreciate you coming to listen and I, you know, connecting. For me, I really, I, I think it's, you know, doing science and publishing is sort of the, the game, getting things funded. But it's, for me, it's interesting, more interesting to talk to you guys and figure out how you might actually use this information. Because it makes me think about the data in a different way. And it makes me think about the broader sort of implications for this work. So I really, I really um, appreciate you coming and spending time. And I know that these conversations are often sort of like, oh, we have a bunch of ideas and you don't hear from me for a bunch of years. <laughs> and it's like, oh, guess what? Um, so I hope that, you know, if you've got questions, if, if you want to bug me about something, I'd be happy to hear it. If you have more questions now, we didn't, I, the IBWC, I've never um, talked to you folks about tree rings. And I, I know um, I, I went to a conference in Santa Fe and Sally Spenner was there and she talked about the, the um, Rio Grande Compact and all the negotiations and, I, and she was the first person that said, you know, the Rio Conscious is like a totally different system and yet that is the Rio Grande once you get, you know, below El Paso. <laughs> so that was really interesting to me to, to hear about. I, I can say that your, your work has been very helpful uh, in dealing with a lot of um, folks in trying to get them to look ahead in, in terms of water use planning who think that uh, climate change is a liberal conspiracy, you can say, okay, no climate change, let's just be ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical mm -hmm. about it. That which has been will be again, and it, it's, it's very useful to get, get past that issue. Right, it's yeah. It's very easy to do that. Way. That's also, I mean, you know, going into the future, of course, the future isn't going to be the same as the past, but natural variability is not going to turn off. We're going to have this, whatever has been going on and driving it in the past is going to continue into the future. So it's important to, to know about that as well. So I think it's... it's interesting. We've been using it the same way that Hill stocks have been back too. You get into that, you know, climate change, whatever, if you were to shut down. Yeah. But if you go in and say, hey, here are these tree ring reconstructions, you can put it in, you can see how these things tie together. Yeah. And guess what? You know, the droughts that have been out there are longer than anything we've made it through. Right. We've got to figure out ways to be able to make it through what we know has occurred in the past. Right. What we worry so much about model work. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It can be used to isolate the difference between climate change and the natural. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, is this, you know, is this event we're seeing now, is it 
Is it way out of the range of natural variability? We can say that for temperatures now, but we can't say that for precipitation. You know, we just precipitation is there's so much more noise in the system that even if it's something is happening that's that's due in large part to climate change. I mean, there have been papers that will argue yes, we there is a discernible proportion that we're seeing now that you can say, but I'm I'm still you know I'm not convinced. I think you know we we really. There's a there's a broad range of variability in the past. In my experiences, we haven't gone outside of it. A individual event could have a contributions if you could separate it out, but we haven't gone outside of what we would expect from natural variability. You took a look at trying to look at the last ten years of say peaks in the low runoff that we were occurring even in Colorado, the historic record. Because we were hearing people say, you know, we're seeing these things that are outside of right. anything anybody's knows in the history. And the reality was, you go back and you look at the OMB index, you know, <coughs> flows and things like that that go to the 1890s, and you can find dates in the 30s yeah. where the peak came before recently. There's only one year last year we, we had a March peak. And only went up on the Chama that came earlier than one Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>